would ask everyone in the audience to please stand for our prayer led by Councillor Donna Suzak, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. In this time of year, as we look at the budget, I'd like for everybody to pray for the fact that we can perhaps learn from our past, provide for the needs for today, and plan for the future. Thank you. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Donna. May we have roll call, please? Councilor Suzak. Here. Councilor Arnone. Here. Councilor Bosco. Here. Councilor Sakala. Here. Councilor Davis. Here. Councilor Denny. Here. Councilor Edgar. Here. Councilor Paul. Here. Mayor Copen. Here. Deputy Mayor Lee. Councilor Ludwig. Here. There's 10 members present, one is absent. All right, uh, next item on the agenda is our fire evacuation announcement. Just remind everyone in the audience that in the event that the fire alarm sounds here at Town Hall, we all must evacuate the building. Closest exit is to the rear of council chambers and out to the front of Town Hall. But if you choose to take the side door to your right or left, we then ask that you take the back set of stairs to the back parking lot of Town Hall. And in the event that an AED is needed, there is one located in the lobby on the main floor of Town Hall. Minutes of the preceding meetings, we have five to consider. First is a special meeting April 13th. Motion to approve. By Councillor Falk, seconded by Councillor Denny. Any discussion? Sensing none, show of hands. All those in favor? Those opposed? Any abstentions? One abstention. <coughs> special meeting April 17th. Motion to approve. Councillor Second. Falk, seconded by Councillor Arnone. Discussion? Show of hands. All those in favor? Those opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimous. Uh, regular meeting, April 17th. So moved. By Councillor Second. Arnone. Seconded by Councillor Denny. Discussion? Show of hands. All those in favor? Those opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimous. Special meeting, April 18th. So moved. By Councilor Arnone, seconded by. Second. Councilor Suzak. Discussion. Show of hands, all those in favor? Those opposed? Oops. Any One abstention? Uh, Sakala, Arnone, Edgar, Bosco. Abstain. And special meeting April 24th. So moved. Second. Councilor Suzak, seconded by Councilor Arnone. Discussion? Show of hands. All those in favor? Those opposed? Any abstentions? One abstention. All right. Next item on our agenda is our special guest section, and we actually have three groups of special guests. Um, first is the uh, our legislators. So I'd like to call up uh, Senator John Kissel and State Representatives Carol Hall and Greg Stokes. Put you in the middle, Carol. They have um, <laughs> come here at our request to potentially provide a legislative update. <laughs> but the That's question funny. is, what as, do they know? As we laugh. <laughs> right. So welcome. <sighs> and um, so I'll just turn it over to the three of you. And um, you guys mind if I jump in? No, go right ahead. All right. Today was consensus revenue estimates, and they were abysmal. Uh, to the credit of the Republicans, uh, last week we put together a no-tax increase budget uh, as a basis for creating dialogue. Unfortunately, our Democratic colleagues did not meet the appropes or finance revenue and bonding deadlines last week, so we have a general idea of what they were going to put out, but we don't have a finalized plan with what they were going to put out. We based our budget on January's revenue projections. Uh, as of today, that's off by one and a half billion dollars. And so instead of a three and a half billion dollar hole going forward into the next two years, we have a five billion dollar hole. So Governor Malloy has asked the leaders to meet starting tomorrow. Uh, I don't know why Senate Democrats had a press conference today saying they want to negotiate the budget. 
in public with the media in attendance because typically uh, when you have difficult discussions you, you you know you go into executive session or you you know you, you want to sort of be able to throw ideas out there without everyone just being tagged so I don't know how that's going to work out but it's daunting we've been in a predicament like this in the past uh, when we got hit the Great Recession but everybody in the country was in the same spot Connecticut seems to be in a very unique spot uh, th the other point and to his credit Governor Malloy says it's not we're not going to be looking at tax increases right off the bat but when there's difficult spending cuts coming down the road it's going these are going to be difficult decisions but it's the quarterly filers the paycheck withholding seems to be relatively stable which I thought was pretty amazing but it's the quarterly filers that have capital gains uh, you know the hedge fund guys uh, maybe they're just not getting their Wall Street bonuses or maybe they're just leaving the state uh, but the top 100 filers between last year and this year the revenue we derive from them has gone down uh, 40, over 40 percent 45 percent so with that I'm happy to turn it over to Carol and Craig but that's it's a we're in a difficult spot well, I'm glad that uh, Senator Kissel could come and start off with all the bad news so, and, uh, <laughs> it doesn't get much better um, just to kind of give you the, the process and stuff obviously uh, folks know the governor gives his budget back on February 7th or 8th and then uh, after that uh, all the committees meet uh, they're working out bills uh, bills that have a fiscal note to it are eventually sent to uh, appropriations appropriations been meeting Carol myself and Senator Kissel serve on appropriations we have met uh, as a full committee for public hearings we have met with our subcommittees I'm on four Carol I think you're on four and I think uh, Senator Kissel John you're on seven I believe subcommittees subcommittees How no many? just three subcommittees three, but, so, okay so I've got a lot of other committees yeah, yeah he's, he's committed out and uh, <laughs> and so we met and we worked on uh, details we went through the budget uh, line by line uh, looking at savings efficiencies um, and uh, uh, our leadership on the Senate side uh, Paul Famica was in uh, with the uh, the chairs of the uh, the Democrat side and the final working of it uh, our ranking member Melissa Zbron was not in a representative it and uh, but uh, when it all came down to it it was uh, last Thursday about 9 30 10 o'clock that we actually got the budget we actually was completed by the leadership uh, by about 5 in the morning I hear and then we got about 10 o'clock and we convened we talked uh, for a second and then we all went to caucus and we went through the budget uh, that was presented the final document three o'clock we went in to hold the vote and uh, and uh, the, the chairs of uh, the Democrat side decided to not call the vote and um, and so at that point in time there was no vote on the budget they had known that because there was a half a, a billion dollars of of uh, tax increases that there were there were no votes on the Republican side and um, and obviously that that was hard to accept but then again that's where you start the, the dialogue and stuff uh, we have been working also with our counterparts on the Republican caucus to put forth a budget uh, that we thought would be prudent uh, no tax increase uh, we think that you know you can solve problems by raising taxes taxes on the short run and everybody's happy but the states had too long a time to where uh, we have uh, rested upon the fact of increasing revenue or or increasing taxes and uh, to solve problems and that causes more short-term problems so our goal is to make a long-term long-term structural change um, the, the Republicans uh, came forth with a uh, joint Senate Republican House budget which has no tax increases uh, and the numbers uh, make it more local for infield it uh, provides uh, I think one point two million dollars more for education the first year and 1.8 the second year uh, it does get rid of MRSA but at the end of the day over the two years the town of Enfield in their funds that come from from Hartford is 959,000 more and so although and there are cuts in there um, and we can talk about those you can ask questions there's a lot of folks not be happy but you can't make structural change without obviously uh, redoing government the way it should be done but I was very pleased with the fact that the uh, the pension for the teachers is not our budget does not thrust it upon the towns 
Uh, we get rid of the public financing for campaigns, many things like that, and, uh, and basically you know, doing our best. So right now, the two budgets that are out there that are actually setting that we've seen is the governor's budget and the Republican uh, budget appropriations, as we should be here presenting to you the appropriations budget. No matter if I voted for or not, it would be appropriate for us to give you the appropriation budget, which is the one that obviously we'll be working from. But there is none, and I don't think that's happened in 149 years. And so uh, sad to see that. But we're going forward and pushing for what we think is right uh, for the citizens of Connecticut and the taxpayers of Enfield. So I'll leave it there. Carol? Um, I, I think you guys hit the highlights. But I think what I want to say is that um, as our first term on appropriations, we actually went to a lot of the, uh, we went to every subcommittee meeting. But what we did in our caucus was we, we caucused and we came up with this budget. And we were there for every single caucus and every single line item cut. And this was above and beyond the appropriations committee meetings. Um, so we spent numerous hours on this budget that we put out as Republicans, and we're very proud of it. Some of the other highlights um, that folks didn't touch on, but we eliminated the tax on Social Security. We eliminated the tax on retirement and 401ks, and that was in our budget with no tax increase, which is huge. It's, it's the one thing that I can remember campaigning that many people said to us, you know, help us stay in the state, get rid of the tax on our retirement. We can't, we can't stay. Um, John hit the highlights on the 100 top taxpayers of the state, 45% drop in revenue is significant. I mean, that's huge. So they were bad numbers that came out today. Quite honestly, all the budgets that were put out by the Democrats and the Republicans have to go back to the table and relook at the numbers. Um, and it's, it's going to be a heavy lift ahead. I mean, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult, but it can be done. I'm happy to, to see that both sides are starting to come together at this point and realize they have to come together and discuss or we're not going to get anywhere. Um, we have <clears> been told it looks like we'll probably be in session till August hmm. at this point is the rumors. So I don't Except know. Except for one, one week. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one vacation week. Um, but uh, I think the most important thing was um, for what Greg said, our revenues for the town of Enfield under the budget that we presented left after two years were 900,000 in the plus side. So it was over and above what the governor had budgeted for the town of Enfield. So if I could we have made out pretty four, good in that. Just, just, these are things that people have contacted us about. And in our budget, the, it restores the fire training funding back to 2012 le levels for the training school for our firefighters. It restores the cuts to care for kids. It restores funding to seniors meals on wheels. And it also, in our budget, it uh, it actually funds for the uh, honor guards for the, the uh, veterans at funerals. And so we, things that people talk locally about to us, we met with folks about care for kids and our budget, those are the things. It, basically, we prioritize, and that's what you have to do when you're in these times. And, and the, the most needy, for instance, we preserve the help for the mentally disabled and those that need those care there. Uh, seniors with the Social Security uh, tax, uh, it's, it's phased out over two years. Uh, the bottom line is, is, is the things that should be prioritized, the most needy, our seniors, our vets, our children, uh, education, those things are prioritized in our budget. So. And you, you all have copies of the state uh, consensus revenues that you should have been uh, given tonight by, by Brian. We did uh, email them earlier as soon as we got them this afternoon. They're hot off the press about 2 or 3 o'clock they came in. So um, you all can look through them and see where the revenues uh, drop. And it's, it's not pretty. And so. everything is fluid, too. And so when I say the good news for Enfield, obviously with the news today, they're going from, you know, a um, – Three billion dollar deficit to a five billion dollar deficit. We have to go in and work our, our numbers, obviously. Again, um, I am pleased to say this: is that you know I've been I watch the news. I have it on in my office all day long. Saw the press conference today about the uh, everybody doing the budget out in public. I don't know how that would work. 
Um, I was happy that the governor said that it may be time for to, to listen to Republicans and Democrats, everybody together. And although this is a very stressful time, and although this uh, is is a time in which uh, you know there's chaos, we don't know exactly what to do. It does force people to have to finally come together, and uh, and as we found on council, when both parties work together, none of us are ever happy with the final document we put out in a budget. But maybe that's good for the citizens because <coughs> we begin to be realistic about what we can do together. And so I'm still I'm still um, optimistic that uh, we can work together, and I'm willing to, and I know my colleagues are so. Just a little bit more about the quick process. We we actually worked very closely with the Senate on their budget because the process that um, the committee comes up with is the Senate came up with their budget and then the House came up with their budget. And we kind of merged the two documents. So it was it was actually a really great collaborative effort, I think, between the House Republican Senate and the House uh, Republican um, representatives, and it was a good document that got merged. We used a lot of the Senate's budget in ours. Um, we had a couple of different things in the appropriations from the House side, but we ultimately went with the Senate budget, which was a great document. Yeah. So, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Give credit. Very good. Um, time for some Q and A. Sure. sure. All right. Tom? If we can't answer a question today, we we'll would definitely uh, write them down and get yep, back. Yeah, not a problem. Thanks for coming out tonight. I, I just wanted to speak on the projected numbers, too, because we know that <laughs> Thursday it was the, the $450 million we we came into of, of more. And the, the numbers you use, Senator, the, the $1.1 or the $1.5 billion is over a two-year period. It's, it's So it's, people don't understand that it's, it, it actually, it's today. The, the 450 actually sort of settled down to like 413 or something like that. So it actually that part of it got a little bit better. Right. And, and, that's, and with those numbers, too, that makes the Republican plan as well as the governor's plan both out of balance because mm -hmm. right. you're all going to have to go back in now and try to, you know, figure out how to how to, you know, take care of that extra money. I, I uh, you know, this was a, an issue with Alaska when Alaska got to their high, the highest income levels. And then we had to uh, they had to uh, live with lower income levels because you only stay at the top for so long. And Connecticut has been at that income level now at the top for a number of years. And uh, I'm sorry that we didn't see this coming. And, and this is a natural progression in a lot of uh, uh, states that end up being the richest incomes in the in the country, which Connecticut has been. And, and I think we're moving out of that trend now, and, and we're going to have to bite the bullet. I, I give the governor huge credit. I mean, he's he's calling for huge layoffs, which I, I, I'm just saddened to hear. Um, he's bitten the bullet on this and, and thrown back a really tough budget. And uh, I don't agree with a lot of it myself, but he had to do what he thought was right for Connecticut. So I, I really appreciate working together uh, to hearing that today in this day and age in, in such a fiscal mess um, uh, it's the only way we're going to bail ourselves out of it is ideas from both sides of the both sides of the uh, party so so thank you for saying those words I appreciate it and coming out here tonight yeah thanks questions comments it's really just it's really just the beginning of, a, of the process mm -hmm. And, and I've seen it work out in a relatively short period of time and I've seen it go all the way under Governor Rell to September and so it could be anything in between. It just depends on the, the, the climate in that room when they all meet tomorrow, if it's, if it's collaborative or if it's finger pointing, and hopefully it's, it's, it's none of those things. And the other thing that I sort of take heart at with is the, the message that the governor is saying, and maybe he feels a little freer now that he's announced that he's not running for re-election, but if you look at the numbers, it's going to be very difficult to balance this year's budget by July 1. But he said, flat out today, he says, we're not going to borrow to do it. Right. Now, they only have two months, so you couldn't like lay someone off because you're not going to get a year's worth of salary. You're going to only get two months. But he said that they have things that they're thinking of to try to cut spending. Uh, and so that's heartening. Uh, the first of the biennium years is like, is not as bad as the second. The second's the one that starts moving up because you look at these revenue estimates and then you project out. And back when I started in the, in the Senate, we only used to budget one year at a time. And one of the things that we try, and we, in my first couple of years, is uh, we push through, and I think it's when the, the Republicans were in charge of the Senate for those two years, is we adopted the biennium budget style so that we would have more predictability. So. Uh, 
But that second year is always difficult to predict. But you're correct. We've been, uh, and the governor said, overly reliant on multimillionaires, uh, and, and those days are, aren't here anymore. So I have a, a couple of questions. Um, uh, first, on, on the document that Greg and Carol, you sent over. So fiscal year 2017 for the state is today. Correct. Correct? Correct. Correct. So the way we read this is, so as the very top line, personal income tax, I'm assuming that's $8,000,000. Nine hundred and eighty-six million dollars, and then so they're projecting eighteen and nineteen, which would be your your two-year budget. Right. right. But they actually go one more year after that as well into the next two-year cycle. Yep. And so when we look down at the bottom, this that's the way we can compare what mm -hmm. currently is coming in versus. So we 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 got to look at seventeen versus eighteen right. to get a handle on what you're facing. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, and then you're, at least Greg and Carol are aware, because you were part of the council, is that um, our charter, um, we, uh, we have a pretty hard stop, and uh, it's right around May 15th. Um, we don't have the ability, um, you know, had the town attorney take a look at, at the charter. Um, we don't have, you know, an opportunity to push off the timeline, and we don't have an opportunity to revisit and change. Um, so what advice would the three of you give to us, knowing that in two weeks from today, we're scheduled to adopt a budget? When we're looking at state revenues, what advice would you give our town manager and the council as to, and, and it's perfectly okay to say, punt <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but what are you hearing in, in in that just so you know in our budget with in, in the budget also has and if you could flip the mic just so that we make sure we get you in our budget we also have language in our budget uh, if it was approved that would would, would mandate that the uh, municipal funding would have to be revealed and set by March 1st uh, going forward and so that would help you guys as well as every other town that does that too so I don't know uh, he, our senior senator may have the better read because he's been through this before I would say plan on a worst case scenario can always be pleasantly surprised after it's all over mm -hmm. but assume that it's the, the towns are gonna get some kind of hit so if, if, if uh, do we consider the governor's budget as the worst case scenario um, and so that's about a two and a half million dollar loss in, in revenue to the town of Enfield right. as proposed. Do we, however, that comes up in the end, but is that the worst right? I mean, I, I, I think there's a looking? general consensus we don't want to push the teachers' yeah, retirement that, onto the towns because it's fundamentally unfair. You guys didn't negotiate right. that, so why right. should you suffer the burden? But there may be other cuts to, to revenue streams to municipalities. Right. And uh, whether I'd go as high as the governor's, I, I don't know that. I know that our caucus, uh, or both of our caucuses, work together to try to minimize the impact of the town. I get a little frustrated with the new head of CCM because what they're putting out there would cost $3 billion in taxes. I, I think they're sort of looking out for the big cities, but not the medium towns, and mm -hmm. that's sort of a disconnect. The cost people are much more realistic. Uh, and what I, what I can try to do is we're going to, I think the house is in tomorrow. We're not in until Wednesday. We're in the next three days in a row, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you poor guys. Yeah. We're only in <laughs> on Wednesday, maybe Thursday. But at that time, uh, Senator Fasano will give us a better idea as to how the temperature is in the room tomorrow. And I think that all three of us should work very closely with you to try to yeah. give you as much awesome. input as possible f for the next two weeks. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, because this is a very trying time, uh, I don't know that would go all the way down to the governor's budget. Um, from my read, the very fact that appropriations couldn't put forth a budget because, to be honest with you, you know, we were steadfast on our side about no tax increase. Uh, but at the same time, there was a lot of things in the, in, the, in the budget document that wasn't approved that, okay, we like, we were talking about that. And so I think there's some good ideas and stuff. The very fact that they didn't call for a vote because it wasn't votes on the other side. Now, that can sound political, but I think it's also a good thing, which means if you don't have enough votes to pass somebody, people are going to have to end up talking. 
in which I do think when you end up talking, you talk about the priorities and you talk about the needs for the towns. I do know this from, I'm talking both sides of the aisle, I think there's a great uh, concern for, for education. Uh, whatever formula is used, uh, there's a concern for public education. So, so you know, I th I'm going to say this for myself, I think if there's any type more hit, it may be on the town side, not so much on the education side, that's my guess, because from the passion I hear in, in as you know, you can always hear in the hallways what everybody says, we, we're not touching education. Um, so maybe somewhere in the middle, but I, I, I would be conservative with your budget. It's better to come in under budget, get more money, and then, then, then you're able to figure it out from there. So, but we will communicate like crazy with you. I, and by the way, that means anybody here, if you have a question, uh, I think most of you have my cell or our sales or whatever, you can call and ask a question. I'll be happy to give you the answer I have at that point in time or to my ear, okay? Thanks. And, and just a Go quick ahead. comment okay. that I think, I think I agree with Senator Kissel and Greg on the fact that the teachers' pensions is not, in, in our opinion, humbly going to be pushed down. So I think that that was the biggest increase in the line item for Enfield was the retirement on the teacher pension. So you probably are not going to see that because there was no taste for that on the Democrats or the Republican side of the aisle. So it shouldn't it shouldn't be coming down although, right now. Although Senator Austin, the Democratic oh, yeah. co-chair of Approps, <laughs> yep. had told me that she was thinking of phasing it in more slowly. We heard the word phasing quite a lot. So, it seems to be a popular word. When you know so I'm a little, I'm still a little right. nervous about that. Uh, but when we put together the Republican budget, I know that uh, Senator Fasano was very careful to look at Horton v. Meskel and the most recent decision that's going up to the Supreme Court regarding funding, and <coughs> by Judge Malkauser, hard to pronounce his name, uh, but. He didn't say that the, the money is not enough. He just said that we didn't have a rational formula. And so I think whatever we end up doing, we're going to have to come up with a rational formula that treats municipalities fairly. And I think and that, that helps our towns. And I think to Senator's point, the, our, our budget, we did have a restructure of the funding for education. So we did rework the entire, um, the entire <coughs> structure to fund ECS and special education, and we did change the base number dollars. So um, that was really important to our side because we did want to speak to the lawsuit that was brought. So we thought we had to make an effort, a con concerted effort, right. to change that formula, and we did. Um, the other thing with that in the budget, in the Republican budget, was we fund special education directly every year. There's no guessing game like if you hit that this portion we're going to fund four and a half times it was a flat funded amount the excess cost grant it will be something you can plan on every number. year so that was that was really one of the big yeah. big pushes from the senate side of uh the budget the senate really pushed for that very hard and and it came up with a pretty good formula um, and i have that too if anybody wants to see it we do have the formula that was put together they may be talking about that in the actual budget negotiations from what I heard. Um, also, something that wasn't really well known or even talked about, when appropriations didn't pass the budget, all the bills that were brought forward to the appropriation committee died. So any bills that were put to us for funding when we did not pass the budget out of appropriation by the deadline, died and cannot be brought back up. They can work another way, I guess they can put them in rap, but, uh, rap bills, but right now the bills as they were submitted will not come back up this session. So. All right. Mike? And uh, Senator Tom. Kissel, you hit, well, I'm sorry, first of all, uh, Representative Hall, thank you for putting in the transportation bill. I know it didn't get out of committee, but it would have been great to give the town some flexibility when it comes to busing, which is a big issue in every town, but also in Enfield. Yeah, where again the state has cut the funding, at least allow us to have some. I know it didn't get out of get it out of committee, but hopefully maybe. I do. I do have a response in that. We have somebody in um, education looking at the wording for that statute. They think that there may be some misinterpretation right, from the districts on that. So I should have something in writing for you that may ease the transportation burden for education. Right. I requested that in writing from the education department. So that may, 
that may ease right. that a little bit and we may not have to address it in a bill so that's great okay. and so Question and I, just, on, I just have to let everybody know I have to leave no later than quarter to eight. Mm -hmm. So, I just, so, so just question on, so on, and uh, that's what I had heard too that there's going to be a gradual shift of the teacher's pension that maybe you know it won't happen maybe this year but it, it'll be gradually worked in over the years which uh, from a fundamental perspective I guess I understand but if if you're going to phase it in so I guess my request or my question would be well then can the towns have some flexibility when it opts out to binding arbitration. So if you're gonna if you're gonna make the towns take the liability on, which is okay, if that's the direction of the state, that's fine. But then you should allow the municipalities to be able to at least have some flexibility in how they negotiate their contracts, because mm -hmm. then the state basically gets it both ways. They're dictating the rules. They're telling them they're they're penalizing municipalities who actually manage their budget, to like for example Enfield, who manage it well and have a healthy fund balance. But then you're making them live by the rules, and oh by the way, you're taking the liabilities as well. So I'm just curious if that's something that can be talked about as if if the shift continued if that, maybe it doesn't happen this year but then it's maybe next year or the year after that's part of that negotiation right. and the, the governor has seemed to be open to those ideas as opposed to our friends on the other side of the aisle uh, so we'll see it really a lot of this is going to come down to can the can the governor direct how this all proceeds right. and to his credit he said that the Republican budget was an earnest attempt to to help move the state forward so uh, I almost wonder whether he's happy to negotiate off of our budget as opposed to the Democrats budget and I'm not taking a shot at Democrats but I think the governor knows that we're in a bind because I was just curious on on the revenue so some would argue that the GE leaving a, a year or two ago whenever it was when they left you know out of Fairfield County mm -hmm. that that was sort of the the start of it now it, now the recession is affecting Fairfield County as it's been affecting the rest of the state again I'm just you, you could argue disagree but I'm just saying there's some of that felt in the private sector that really was the message as opposed to losing GE at that point so is that as we as the revenues continue to get forecast is that gonna I mean so I have to be honest it, it's amazing that it seems like we're so far off in our revenue projections oh, I'm yeah, not this criticizing anyone it just it seems like we get a new projection every quarter and it's never a good well, if you keep talking about taxing the rich eventually they're going to sit right. down with their tax attorneys and accountants and figure out what they're going to do right. and if you say we got to just hammer the hedge fund guys well all you have to do is lose a couple of those folks and it's tens of millions of dollars right. and so the governor actually was quoted today as saying we shouldn't even be discussing some of these things because even if they don't pass it sends a terrible message to these folks that we rely on so, so, so that's so how's the fundamental shift going to continue? So, as to your to your point on, you know, budget for the worst case scenario, which I think is the right you know approach. But, but again, it seems that the state's approach. I'm just saying in general mm -hmm. is that again, municipalities that manage their budgets and try to live within their means will be penalized, and it just seems that the, some of those municipalities, including cities, who probably are on a brink of bankruptcy, depending on what you you know how you can play with the financial books. Won't 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 have to write the ship, and the burden will be on municipalities like Enfield or what you know because we do have a healthy fund balance. Yeah. So it's almost like the healthier the fund balance, the more penalized you may get. No, and that's why I'm, I'm just I'll just chime in because I may have they may have to have an ability to stay. Uh, that's why my leader, Senator Fasano, said point blank, there will be no Republican fingerprints on a, on a bipartisan budget unless we get structural change in Hartford. Right. That means a real constitutional spending cap that people wanted over 20 years ago. And some of these other things like, and, I, and you know me, I'm not picking on uh, unions. Uh, I've been supported by state employees for many, many years. But I do think that the legislature should affirmatively either accept or reject uh, a contract as opposed to the current system where it just automatically goes into place if nobody does anything. And so some of these changes that our two caucuses have been clamoring for for years, I think that's going to be part of the discussion and, and hopefully that will address your right. concern that if we change the way we do business in Hartford, that helps you guys a lot too down the road because right now we're not, we're dysfunctional. Like, and for instance, on the, the um, Spending cap is always up for definition, and that's always been a problem, whoever wants to define it. And, and under our definition that we put forth is the uh, pension liability is included in the numbers of the pension gap, uh, a cap. And so, therefore, it's a realistic number. Before, it's always been where the pension liability has not been included on the cap, so, therefore, it's not been included. So, so, so we're trying to face things realistically. And, uh, and the bottom line is here is 
the, 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 this is not a, a budget fix for just two years. This is a philosophy switch. This is a structural change that will send a signal to the millionaires. And although, you know, we're, we, we have, some people always talk down about the millionaires. Well, with their own state, they pay taxes, and we, and we thank them for that. Uh, the businesses and stuff, we need to send a signal to them that uh, this is going to be a great place to do business in and to raise families and have workers come into the state. And that's the same thing with, uh, with uh, phasing out the tax of Social Security and on pensions is to tell the senior citizens that, listen, you know, uh, we want you to stay. Uh, and cause I know a lot of senior citizens that don't want to move south because their grandkids are here. I'm one of those. I, you know, we talk, all, all my grandkids are here, and our fifth one's coming next month, and, you know, we want to stay here. And I would like to have a state that is uh, is favorable to me staying here because it's easier to live. And so, uh, and and so, um, obviously, we want to send the right signal that we're open for business. So. Plus, they got alligators down in Florida anyway. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike. Just to the other part of your question, the office of OFA is looking into that specific question on why the revenues for those that 45 percent drop was so miscalculated and that's right in the letter appreciate they sent it, right. out so they are looking into it to again, try I to explain it appreciate you folks showing up here this is i mean this is important i mean this really is the fact that you're willing to come here because again i just don't realize some people don't realize the fundamental shift that's going on in our economy yep. that really is it's 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 different than i think most of us felt in our lifetime so i appreciate the folks that you guys have come up here it's great i mean this is very inf uh, inf informative and I, just for the record i'm against tolls <laughs> we all are, we I think. All our three, all our three of us have, are. Does not have tolls, so. And I, I think to your point, we thought we'd be here tonight because <coughs> all the the finance deadline passed and appropes passed. So we thought we'd be bringing you a real budget and real numbers tonight. So we apologize that we could have probably canceled tonight and just said, hey, you know, we'll get you the information when it comes in. But these revenue numbers were important to get to you today and. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tom? Well, the news you did give us is the pension news. So if we were two, two million, two and a half million down on a worst case scenario, the, the pensions alone were $2 million to the town of Benfield. Exactly. So with that they off the, the table, chunk. that is huge news today for yeah. us and for our whole educational system in, in that part because they always get hit hard with that. And so educational education cost sharing. Um, it sounds like you're all, everybody's in favor of some kind of new formula. Mm -hmm. So I get to shaking heads, yeah. which is good, oh, yeah. because yeah. that other half a million can be taken up very quick if, if some of the shift was given to the towns with the, the needed the most, which Enfield would be. Right. Um, so we would fit into that quite nicely. Right. Um, and, and that's so if I had anything to ask you tonight is to look at that formula and, and try to get some common ground to help the needy towns first. And then we're looking good. Ours then did. you walk out of here tonight and I feel better. Yeah, ours did. <laughs> so, and, and hopefully they'll look at the formula that the Senate and the House put forward in their budget because it's a good one. And, and to be honest with, you, with me is is the educational funding is, is big priority. And I've, I've communicated and talked to Chairman Sherrard a number of times and so try to keep him informed. He came and testified before appropriations, did a wonderful job standing up for infield. And, um, and the fact of the matter is, is that as we go back, the, uh, the first number I always look at when we get documents is what, 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 is, what is the number we're looking at for info education. And, uh, and obviously, um, you know, money doesn't solve all your problems, but uh, with resources being cut and stuff over the years and stuff, uh, it's, it's nice to see that we get that back from the state. And we'll keep, we'll keep working towards that. Bill. John, before you head out. Um, yes, sir. Thank you to the three of you for, for being here. Um, I, I read through some of the, the report, uh, the GOP proposed budget, and there was a big section on mandate relief. Do you see um, a part of that that would cancel out the nasty components of Public Act 244 from a couple of years ago? That's the whole section that caused the uh, municipalities to lose revenue from the state if they, you know, manage their own budget in a certain way. That's caused us to um, create uh, different programs for different fire districts and, and so forth. If if the state's not meeting its obligation, do we see pu that public act kind of being negated um, in this budget or in future budgets? <clears throat> 
I know that at least within my caucus, and I would assume the House Republican caucus as well, we think it's fundamentally unfair to penalize municipalities that are well run. And those municipalities, not solely, but tend to be represented by Republican representatives and senators. So there will be a big push not to penalize towns for being successful. And there also will be a push to try to untie your hands a little bit, things like you know minimum spending on education and things like that, that may be controversial. There may be some moms and dads out there saying, well, if the towns don't have a minimum, then maybe they'll just they start cutting like crazy. But for us not to fund you appropriately and then require you to do stuff, that's fundamentally unfair. So again, so much is going to be set in motion starting tomorrow. But if you look at our, our budget, you can sort of see the direction that, we're, that our two caucuses want to see the state moving towards. And again, I'm, I'm very hopeful that the governor, now that he's not at least running for governor again, uh, can use his, his bully pulpit and use his authority to drive the conversation in a way that's sustainable in the long term. So I think we understand where you're coming from. Yeah, and I just for everyone else, if, if you didn't remember it, it was two years ago now, if, the, if a municipality makes a decision to do certain things in its budget and you exceed 2.5% spending than where you were a year ago, the state takes aid directly from you. Um, I think that so, so any time if we're if we're even hearing the word shift, um, you know, used in a sentence down there, that's clearly going to impact, you know, the long-term spending plans of a lot of municipalities. And that, you know, if 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 it's going to be something we have to bear, then that that public act needs to be retired quickly. I, I believe, and Karen and I was talking about. You got to understand is is, you know. We're grasping all we can with the information, but that conversation, that's the spending cap for towns, the municipal spending cap. It came up, and I'm trying to remember whether we did so. I can check with that, but it did come up, and, and there seemed to be bipartisan support to to get rid of that, you know, or, or, or it, it, yeah, there was not support for that because of what we're dealing with right now. Because we knew that if we're going to be doing things that affect municipalities, that they have to have the freedoms to govern their own towns. And so, so, and I think that was a broad base for support from I, I came up with education committee, which we're both on and, and appropriations. So I can double check on that. All right. Anyone else? Perfect. Any final comments? Thank you for having us yes, tonight. Yes, the lines of communication. Yeah, open. We'll, yes. we'll keep in touch as we get fed these documents that we got to you today. We'll we'll keep feeding them as quick as they're coming in because I, if we can get something, if some miracle happens before you guys vote, we'll get it to you fast. Or at least broad brush something. Yeah. Broad brush. In fact, probably before you said the fifteenth of May is when you're going to make it. You know, obviously, um, we can have a conversation with you as leadership or. We'll keep you informed and try to give you the best directions we possibly can so that town manager and you all can do what's best for infield. And, uh, and I think the key thing is together we, we can get through these trying times. I think I think the big thing that, that was helpful for your budget, just having conversations with um, Scott and Bill, was removing the big line item for Nathan Hale. I mean, that's that's a huge nut. So if you can use that building for, you know, continued school use, if it's... For storage. storage alone, it saves you that bond money. So that's that's huge. It's it's a big deal. So, thank you for inviting us. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much. Have a good evening. Enjoy thank your you. evening. So. Have fun, guys. Yes. Thanks, Next on our list of special guests, we have our registrars of voters. Lou Fiore and Mark Sheehan. <coughs> Welcome, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Just for case you give me a second, you have to be start. Go right ahead. Okay, um, most of you think know who I am. Is that right now? Lou, is, your, is the mic on with the light? Hello. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a Lou Fiore, the Democratic Registrar of Voters. For those of you who uh, don't know me, it's welcome. Councilman Fock, good to see you again. You Former Councilman good. Ludwig, good to see both of you. It's been a while. Uh, I'd like to introduce the other members of the team who are here tonight. And I'm going to go kind of reverse order a little bit. There's a reason why. 
Um, my deputy, Democratic deputy, uh, Tom Stelgaitis, is here tonight. And also the Republican deputy, Kelly Wauer, is here tonight. And last but not least, the uh, Republican registrar, Mark Sheehan, is here tonight. The last time we were here, he was head moderator, so I think Mark possibly wanted to say something here. Good evening. I'm Mark Sheehan. I took over as the Republican registrar in February to replace <laughs> David Wauer. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm first time registrar, but I've been working in the elections and in the registrar's office for 20 years. So, um, and with Kelly Wauer as my assistant and working closely with Lou, we, we have a good handle on everything going on in the office there. Yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to play on that a little bit more if I can, Mr. Sure. Mayor, if you don't mind. Yep. Give the uh, kudos here again. Uh, Mark was the head moderator here for at least probably the last 10 years, 8 to 10 years. So it was more than proficient to take over as a registrar of voters. Um, he ran most of the election day uh, moderator, assistant moderator things that going on in all the voting places. Kelly Warer was uh, Dave's uh, deputy for 8 to 10 years, so she's, you know, right up to snuff. I think most of you know Tom Stelgaitis, who was the moderator at Barnard for 10 years, and I tapped him two and a half years ago to be my deputy, and, well, I've been around for a while, so we won't go into <laughs> my credentials, if you don't mind. And also, our, our administrative assistant has been in the office for 10 years, so I, we really do have a really, really good team. And I'd like to mention more about our management team, if I can. As most of you are aware, we have moderators and assistant moderators in each of our five voting locations. So counting ourselves in the office and those people, there's 20 of us total. As of tonight, 17 out of the 20 have been recertified by the state of Connecticut with all the qualifications, and the other three remaining will be certified in August. So we really are ahead of the ball game here for the next upcoming elections, and we're very proud of the team we have. And Mark and I are always on a scout for promoting people within the, the voting team into those uh, quasi-management positions as we go along. So we're, we're always doing that. In the last November election, which was... Uh, not, actually, not as hectic as the April primary last spring, this time last year. We had an 82% turnout here in the town of Enfield, in case you didn't know. Over 19,000 people voted in the November election. We had 420 EDRs, or same-day registrations, downstairs in the <coughs> Enfield room. We had a team of five. We thought we were only going to get 300. We had 420. And that's actually registering people, checking if they've already registered in another town, and then having them vote. In addition to that, we had about 1,150 absentee ballots. And through all that, we had very few problems or concerns. And we listen, it's, it's a manual effort. There's always going to be a few hiccups. But I think basically our, our problems were very, very minimal. Smooth. We have a very experienced staff that do it. So it went very smooth. We had no issues. Yeah, just nothing we couldn't solve immediately. But, you know, it's not just us. The 20 of us in the management team and the 60 workers we, we have. It's also, as I've done this in the past, it's a team here in the town of Enfield. First of all, the town clerk's office, Suzanne's office, doing the absentee ballots and then helping us on election day and filling in for us when the office is closed when people come to register. We couldn't, we couldn't do it without her and her team. Absolutely not. The building and grounds, Mark Garr and Doug Finger and Ken, head of the custodians. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't operate any of the polling places without their assistance. They, they're there for us for almost a whole week. The school principals, you know, we, we basically use the schools uh, in town hall. So, I mean, they're, they're with us all the way. And f actually, believe it or not, even the finance and tax department. John Wilcox's staff, because we process bills, sometimes emergency bills come up, they're always there to assist us. And across the hall in the tax department, because our office is so small, we were registering 75 people a day for two and a half, three weeks. And people were lining up. We actually had to use the tax department to ask people to go in and use their, you know, their desk area to have people register because there's just no room in our small little office. So again, I want to give kudos to all those people in the staff. And yep. I'm sure I probably forgot some other other members. In the last election, as you mentioned, I mentioned last time I was here, we had new IVA equipment for the uh, handicapped or voting people need voting assistance. That went very, very well, probably exceeded our expectations. The state really did a nice job rolling that out, and the training they gave us was really excellent and without, without a hitch. It was used in the three out of the five voting places, and, and it just was a tremendous um, uplift over what kind of equipment we had before for the people who need voting assistance. Right now, we have that old equipment, and a town manager and I have been getting ready to disperse of that old equipment some old fax machines and phones because we won't be using those anymore. The new equipment actually is laptop with touch screen with a laser printer right at the voting site. So that went very well. We were very pleased with that. The new system 
doesn't require a phone system, so there will be an expense saving there because the new system is more of a computer that does your blackout for you. And in the first year, the first election we used it, we've already had far more people use it than all the years that we had the old system. So, and nobody complained. They all thought it was a much more convenient system and much uh, better for our handicapped voters. And a matter of fact, you, you don't have to be handicapped or need assistance to use that equipment. Anybody can use that. Some st they're actually selling that so that some states might actually use that equipment as a rational voting equipment. So, but we're not doing that in Connecticut. These, as I mentioned before, last time I was here, the state purchased all that for us. We just have to pay the programming costs. And then starting, not in this budget, but the following budget, we actually have to start paying for the maintenance on it. But at least we didn't have to purchase it. We did also implement a new election night reporting system, f which we will not be using for this election because it's a municipal election coming up. Unfortunately, that didn't go as smooth as uh, Mark and I were hoping. Um, it just didn't go as smooth as we were hoping. We were trained, but it just didn't go as smooth as we were hoping. So I apologize for that. <laughs> and uh, uh, we actually were hoping to use it again because now we know what we did wrong. We won't do it again. <laughs> but we won't be using that in this November. The other thing that Mark and I have been discussing with our deputies, and we actually had a tour about a month or three weeks about ago. Month, yeah. As you know, we were at Enfield Street School. And now that the Enfield High um, additions is basically done, renovation is almost done, we did have a tour about possibly, I'm emphasizing, careful my words here, possibly moving the Enfield Street location over to Enfield High in the back. It's something Mark and I are talking about. We're exploring it. If, if we were to do it, we, we would want your input, please. Drive over there, tell us what you think. Uh, we wouldn't be doing anything in this election, so it won't be for the municipal elections coming up in this September. Everything will remain the same until next year. Until next if year. The early, if the earliest, if we make any decision at all. If we make any decision at all, it wouldn't be until August of 2018. Okay? So, but please, we want your input, too, into you know, what you think is feasible. We know we've had some limitations with Enfield Street, especially when there's primaries. When there's a regular November election, it's not a problem with Enfield Street. When there's a primary, when there's a September primary or an April primary, we have to use the back of the Enfield Street School, which really is limited in nature. It, we're, we just barely get by. It can be hazardous at times. School's in session, so we can't use the cafeteria in the front during those days. Enfield, Enfield High, if we could go into the back into the gym for every election. That's the nice part. It's a bit more easily handicapped available. It's in and out. There's plenty of parking. When school's not in session, there's, we, we believe there'll be plenty of parking if school's in session. The downside is it's in the back of the building and not in the front. So please, please drive down there, take a look, and please get back to Mark or myself or our deputies with, with your opinion. We wouldn't want some input on this. Something we're considering for, next, for the future. The other thing I wanted to mention, and I think most of you know, but just as a reminder, when, when you received our budget this year, we always budget out for two elections, even though as most of you know, we don't always have two elections. It just seems to be more feasible for us to do that instead of budgeting for one, and if we had to, to come in and ask something from, from another expenditure. So again, as you were going through the budget, I know you're almost done. I'm sure you're all happy for that, been there, done that. I see the smiles already, huh? <laughs> um, just want to mention that again, it's for two elections. As, as you know, our, there wasn't really much change in our budget. A couple of really more line item switches than anything else. Um, you know, minimum wage did go up, so we do have to pay our workers a little bit more. Uh, we saved some money in a few line items, but we've added some more in some other line items. Uh, but basically, it's it's very minimal uh, change at all from, from uh, the last, last two budgets. One of the biggest things I wanted to mention in the budget, just so that you are cognizant of this, is one of the big increases we had last year. And also, one of the line item increases we had this year was in our postage, which is, you know, you say, you know, why the postage? Well, one of the reasons was last year we spent $3,000 in postage this fiscal year. Part of it was because of the presidential election and those registrations I was saying. We had 75. I mean, every one of those has to get a, a letter. Every, everything we do, you have to put a mailing out for. And on top of that, we had the new interface with the DMV system, which is working really nicely. It's working really nicely. So now we're getting more registrations. It's very easy for people to change their party affiliations or to change their address. So we're getting more more um, throughput through there, which, of course, is increasing our postage. And we're doing a little bit more with the canvases in the last couple of years than we were doing prior. In prior years, they would do a larger canvas every five or six years. We're trying to do a little bit more each year instead of doing that big bang every five or six years, stay on top of the voting list a little bit more precise. So that's 
adding to our postage. So again, I just wanted to mention that those are the types of changes that we are having in, in our budget. Those are the type of changes going forward that we, we see postage might even be going up even more as we go. Mark knows he works for the post office, so we might be even seeing more increases there. Plus, as we add more voters, when you do your canvas, you're now canvassing more people every time. And DMV, the numbers every day we come in, we've got several from DMV, and every one of those requires a letter to the voter. So that's one of the reasons why our postage continues to rise. So that kind of wraps it up for our little overview. We just wanted to get in here and just say hello to everybody and just give you an update on the last election and see if there was any budget questions or concerns you had going forward. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Questions for our registrars? Mike? Just a few, I just want to say, since you were mentioned, you uh, promote from in. The folks over at JFK have been there the last three elections. They're fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. Even at 830 <laughs> at night when they're exhausted, they're still in a good mood. Great, great staff over there. Yeah, thank you. Everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, really saying, great staff. I think, if I can, the, all those staffs in all four voting locations, we actually, this is a fifth one here, but for special voting, as you know. Those people are there the night before the election at four or five. They set up the election area to around seven or eight, depending on, you know, the, the group. And then they're up at four in the morning the next morning. They have to be there at the voting place for quarter after five in the morning or 5.30 at the latest, but they have to be there by quarter after five, and then they stay, the bulk of them, till 9 o'clock at night, and then some of them will even stay in the system management team till 10, 10.30, 11, and cleaning up and packaging everything. So it's truly a Herculean effort from, from some of these people, that it, and they're not doing it for the money. <laughs> it's pretty minimal. Well, it's funny, in a budget, the one thing I guess you can take as an increase in your line item is folks who are, are participating in the democracy. So I guess that's okay. That's a good thing. It really is. Yeah. We and really saw a real big increase this year. We really did. Tom? Do you do all your mailings in-house, or do you uh, get assistance um, for, you know, postage? Uh, no, we, we do. You do it all in-house? We do it all in-house. Um, Last year, we, we could have done, last year, because of the presidential election, we, we were able to process our canvas, stuff the envelopes, but then we had to hold that until after that April primary last year. We could have, you know, we could have done it out of, out of house there, but it's, it, we, there wouldn't be any cost savings by, by going outside of house. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Any further questions, comments? And gentlemen, thank you. It's great to see. You know, it's been the history of our registrar's office of of the two parties really working together well. And um, so please keep up the great work. Extend our thanks to, to your entire team for a job well done. And uh, on to November, right? Right. Yes. Or yes. a primary. Hopefully. Or a or primary. Uh, yeah. Hopefully not. <laughs> 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 Thank, Thank you, you Lou. For, Thank you, Mark. For, for yeah. both of our for both our parties. <laughs> Hopefully, none of us have to take uh, lose our va August vacations for a September Correct. primary. <laughs> Thank you. Good seeing everybody. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And for our final group of special guests, Enfield High School Building Committee. Uh, I know Randy's coming up. Is Amar coming up? And Dean is coming up. Anyone else? Oh. Randy, you can you could also recognize your uh, your fellow committee members that are here. No, yeah. oh, I messed it up. Hi there. This is Randy Daigle. I am fortunate enough to be the chairman of the Enfield High School Building Committee. Um, we do have some committee members here this evening. We have Dr. Austin in the back. We have Wendy Osada. Uh, we have Chris who works for Silver Petroselli. Dean Petroselli with Silver Petroselli Architects Engineers. And I'm Marsha Moss with Gilbane Building Company with the construction managers on the project. So today, and I apologize, I know we were on the agenda last time. Um, it, didn't get put on my calendar, so um, I apologize for that. Um, I, we just wanted to come here and, and uh, give you an update on where we are. Um, Phase-wise or stage-wise, we are in what's called the punch list item. We're at the closeout. Um, everything is 100% constructed, occupied. We received what are called certificate of occupancies, which allows us to um, occupy the building 
everything's under code and pass inspection. We are in punch list items right now. Um, little things that have to be tweaked here and there. Um, we do have some landscaping that we had to wait for until the good weather comes. We had two trees die and there's a couple other um, trees that are getting put in. Some things got moved. So just very, very minor. Um, so we have another month or two before we can finish all that up. Um, so what we wanted to do is kind of explain where we are. Um, and we also wanted to introduce you to something that we've started um, on this building. Um, it has to do with the O&M manuals. Um, at the end of a project, the owners are usually given uh, all the as-built drawings which show any existing conditions that might have changed from the original drawings. So they're called as-builts now. Um, and, and you're usually given the drawings themselves. Our drawings are 30 by 42 inches and there's close to 1,200 pages. So in order for us to give the owners copies that they would never be able to move and probably five volumes <laughs> of specifications, um, which again would get lost at some point. Um, with Gilbane, this is the very first building in the state of Connecticut that has this <coughs> capability. Um, what, what we're gonna show you after we do our presentation of the f existing bill, I mean of the new building, going through the O&M manuals electronically. Everything that is in this building, from the outlets to the light fixtures to the insulation, had to be specified. Nothing that was installed did not get specified by the architect. Um, and then every piece of equipment has to have a warranty, where to get it, how to obtain it. So all that, all that information is in those O&M manuals. What we've done is, is we've electronically picked every piece of equipment out on every floor on, on the computer. So all you would have to do is identify, point to it, and we'll go through the presentation, but it'll give you everything you possibly will need. Um, this is something that we would highly suggest that we do for every building in the town of Enfield. Um, you get a stick drive, and it has everything that you will ever need on that building. You can make copies. Um, the custodians have been trained on how to use it. Um, so we'll get to that after we go through, but I just want to uh, highlight a couple little things about the project. And this is, has to do with the due diligence from Gilbane, Building Company, and Silver Petroselli, and our building committee. Every single one of our building committee members uh, played a role in this. Uh, we have shaved off from the original contract date 10 months on the build on a construction size schedule wise so what 10 months means is $89,000 per month of just general conditions and with that we're still under we're approximately $750,000 under budget so not only do we save 10 months we we're coming in three quarters of a million under budget um, the high school had their very first band, I mean, um, auditorium performance the other day, Guys and Dolls. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody was able to attend it, but the sound system, the acoustical, the lighting was second to none. I've had so many compliments on what the committee did. It's a state-of-the-art 21st century facility. Um, the, the, the equipment in there is second to none. Wireless mics, no interference. Um, we've gotten so many compliments regarding that. Uh, as you all know, the ribbon cutting for, for the high school is the 13th, May 13th. Um, one, of, one of the things, too, that we were able to do, um, when we, initially this budget, this, the project was estimated to come in at $115 million. Uh, we had to value engineer a lot of it out to get it down to the $103 million range because we just didn't think it would sell. Um, there were some areas that we had to what's called value engineer out. We didn't change the program because uh, that's the most important thing. You don't want to have a building that is not functional program wise. So we changed materials, um, furniture, FF&E equipment, furniture, finishes and equipment. Um, we bid it separately. Um, they put out 32 different trade bid packages to get the best price for every single discipline. 
everything that was value engineered out to get it to the $103 million range was able to get put back in with all the funds that we were able to save it. Um, so we bought state air computer systems, sound systems for the auditorium. The entire building is air conditioned. We can sit 600 people in an auditorium at one time. Uh, we could fit, I'm sorry, we could sit 600 people in the cafeteria at one time, 900 people in the auditorium, and 1,200 in the gymnasium. Before, we'd have to give our kids two tickets to, for graduation if it was indoors. Uh, now, depending upon the enrollment, they can have four to five. Uh, so this was truly a building that is was designed and built for the community. Um, They've been using the gymnasium for over a year now, and um, we get nothing but compliments how our kids, before they used to get off the bus at another school and just totally be intimidated, now they come into our school and they say, bring it on. So uh, it, it's, it's everything about this has been, been great. Um, Memorial-wise, all the bricks that were at the, at the Fermi High School and all the bricks that were pe that people purchased throughout the years around the, the center of the, um, the roundabout for me have all been brought over. All the bricks that were at the high school were combined with Fermi, and that's all around the flagpole, the base of the flagpole. All the monuments that were both at Fermi and Enfield High have been put aside, um, and that is something that the town would have to do at a future date, dedicate one area and have a, some type of a ceremony to honor the four plaques. There was, there was a bunch of plaques where, where they were under trees. We had to move the trees because nothing is the same as, as it was when we started. But we did save all, your, all the monuments. Um, so pretty much with that, uh, I'd like to start the presentation to show you what the building looks like now. And then uh, we'll go through some answer, question and answers, and then we'll show you the O&M manual procedure that we have. Okay. Thanks, Randy. Good evening, everybody. So we brought up some slideshow, some of the progress that we've made over the past two and a half years on the project. Uh, we started this project back in the summer of 2014, about, and uh, substantial completion for the D wing, which is the music wing, was gained back in the late January, early February this past year. And uh, I don't know if it's going to reach. I don't know if it's going to reach. Sorry, that's fine. So, so that's fine. I, I can get closer. So as I indicated, so uh, basically going through some of the photos, some of the progress photos I'm going to show you uh, in a minute is uh, the project, as you may recall, the building uh, was about 165,000 square feet, and it's up to about 312,000 uh, square feet in totality. Uh, some of the area, key areas that Randy indicated earlier that uh, received sig significant amount of renovations, some of them in cases it was a brand new additions. The building had four new additions to the existing building, plus the entire renovation of the, this is a complete renovate as new. So state of the art mechanical electrical systems, lighting systems with lighting controls. It had a lot of all the new architectural finishes. So basically we s renovated the building down to the skeleton and then we rebuilt it all back new windows, new parking lot, and new uh, parking spaces, landscaping, curbs, all of that is all brand new. So some of the photos you'll see in front of you is actually it's a shot of the, the overall building itself. Fermi Wing, as you're all familiar with the, with the building itself, it's about 101,000 square feet. Uh, it contains science, math, and uh, art primarily, and that was a key component of the project. That's actually uh, renovating the building while it's occupied is fairly challenging uh, from a code aspect. We made sure that we did the due diligence as far as meeting and on a daily basis and sometimes twice a day with the fire marshals, the building officials, to make sure that when we construct this building, it's completely the, isolates the construction area from the occupied building with the school and the public <clears throat> to make sure we maintain a safe job site. And by the way, I do want to mention that we over about 850 safe work days with no incidents on the project, and we had multiple, multiple trades. We peaked at about 270 trade workers uh, in a day. So uh, again, it's been a testament to the workers and to obviously the staff on the project that made this happen. Uh, some of the shots you see of the, the new entrance to the uh, auditorium area and the music wing. 
to the right, bottom right, is actually the, uh, uh, again, this is the music area itself, along with the, uh, the exterior looks that's uh, very modernized, and Dean jump in at any point in time to describe some of the architectural flavor that you've uh, brought into this project. Obviously, this is a, a key marquee spot for the building. Uh, some of the interior shots for the building itself, uh, some of the, the new finishes and the lighting and the, brought in a tremendous amount of daylighting into the building uh, along with the colors and uh, again, the science wing, all brand new casework for the science work. So it's, it's been really a great space that was well received. Uh, another more shots of the interior finishes and some of the key components, as you can see, the lighting is very bright. I do remember when we walked the building before Gilbane was selected for the project, that we, I mean, it was like, wow, this building really needs to, uh, need to do something about it. So it was a great uh, turn as far as the building where it was or where it is right now. Some of the key shop areas, again, more daylighting, the stairwells, the communication inside the building is, is improved tremendously with elevators as well as key access points. Again, this is all constructed with the latest uh, ADA standards as well as all the life safety systems. Uh, cafeteria, Randy mentioned, a great, great space. Uh, again, the build, this was doubled, uh, tripled in size, actually. Triple, triple size. And uh, this was a fairly complex part of the building. As you may recall, we had the the old berry tank under and was in the middle of the winter plus this building was shoehorned in inside the existing building very very difficult uh, piece of addition obviously highly uh, involved as far as the kitchen area and all the equipment that came along with it more shots of the uh, the new furniture and the new table and and all the new spaces throughout the clouds the lighting everything just blends tremendously uh, gymnasium, as Randy indicated earlier, the gym space received a significant amount of uh, all the flooring got redone, uh, complete new locker room spaces, the new entrance to the gymnasium itself, it was basically just totally uh, got redone as far as that space. And it's very accommodating, extremely spacious, and very well received. As you can see, the display cases, there's a lot of memorabilia, memorabilia from both schools. Uh, there's a lot of history in this town, and now it's it's one one team, one school. So um, to pay homage, we we combine as much as we can of the Fermi and Enfield. Right. Again, some of the additional shots of that gym main entrance area. This is the display cases that used to be the display cases outside the gym area itself, the gym hallway, if you will, across from the career center. Again, high finishes as far as the woodwork itself, and it's been really maintained very very well. Uh, locker spaces, brand new lockers. I do remember walking through the old locker rooms. I was like, oh my God, this is just total. Again, this meets also ADA, as you can see. So there, are, there are lockers that are meant for wheelchair and ADA, as well as uh, uh, you know, some, some of the, uh, the disability benches and whatnot. Again, this is all required, all had to go through the whole process of inspections. The ADA showers, as you can see, the one on the right is flush with the floor, so that way the this disabled person is able to wheel him or herself in. Uh, all of the sinks in the building are all under uh, the high energy, high efficiency type sinks uh, that maintain, and they've been, again, very well maintained throughout the building. Some of the entrance itself inside, the, as you walk into the A-wing, there's some of the finishes, some of the sounds, and uh, it's been a really great, well used space by uh, all staff. This area that, I'll go back if you sure. can. The area at the front lobby uh, was a big open area. Um, one of the things that we ended up doing after it was built, um, we talked with the, the principal, Andy, is that how would we best utilize that area? Because initially that was supposed to be for the security guards and all those, that type of systems. But since when that all got taken out, it was a big open area. A lot of this, uh, the, the school, we have social areas. We have couches, you have sitting down areas. The teachers can go out and have one-to-one. -one. They can have small learning classes. So that's what we ended up doing with this. We put acoustical panels on the walls, um, and then there's about eight to 10 tables in there. The kids during the Eagle Hour, hour will go there and study. You'll see a teacher working with, they put a couple of tables together. You'll see a teacher working with six to 10 kids. That area there turned out to be a great, great addition to the building. Uh, What's interesting with this is that we, and I can beat Amar by two years, we started this project in 2012, and coming around post Newtown, there was a lot of concern about security. So we actually designed this space for a built-in security desk and some pretty high-tech equipment. 
and obviously over the years with, with any project that runs five years things change and during the duration of the project actually within the last year and a half it was decided to eliminate that security station there and reuse this space actually for the students so it's another example of how during a long process of a project like this we have to bob and weave uh, with the educators with the town in this case with the security uh, concerns and obviously as you can see we utilized this space and really gave it back to the students which ended up being a great solution more of the improvements throughout the building. Again, the, the phase renovation, obviously the tunnel space, the utility tunnel is right underneath that floor. That was a very complex part of the project that we had to maintain all uh, utilities, power, heat, water throughout the building while we're actually renovating it. So it was a very challenging process. The music- well, Incidentally, that tunnel was a fallout shelter or, an, or a shelter uh, built in the 1960s, that tunnel was designed to carry the occupant load of your entire uh, school body. Uh, so it's a large space. It's basically the same size as the corridor above it in terms of height and width. Uh, but interesting, again, coming post, uh, uh, or at least post 1950s, uh, that they had a, uh, a bomb shelter in this school, and obviously that's where all the utilities are ran. We used to go down there and smoke. I don't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> So sweeping around to the to the D-Wing and the Music Wing, obviously the main entrance lobby from where it used to be versus what it is now, great grand space that allows you in the, all the light colors and all the daylighting, as you could see, uh, some of the key music rooms with all the sound acoustics in the ceilings and the large spaces uh, that's been well utilized. Uh, again, this is the part of the project that got completed this past winter. Now, this chorus room here, um, we provided um, a platform stage that they would be performing on for real when they do their productions. <laughs> so we were able to purchase, again, with the extra funds that we value engineered out, the equipment so when they practice, they're practicing on the same step platform that they will be performing in. It's hard to practice when they're all at the same level because you don't get the same pitches. So we purchased this. We also purchased a, um, an eggshell. So if they're doing outdoor performances, the sound gets verberated forwards and not just lost in the atmosphere. Okay, down to the jewel of the project, the auditorium itself, uh, grand space, totally brand new, got actually expanded by almost double the size completely new finishes, sound system, state-of-the-art lighting system, um, again, brand new seats, brand new flooring, brand new concrete floor, as a matter of fact, and all below slab, the network of utilities that went underneath that slab from an electrical standpoint were tremendous. Again, well-received space, well-utilized space, and it's, uh, it's really a, a showpiece. Pretty much where the proscenium opening is at the stage was the back of the stage. Right from the original. More right. shots of that same uh, space itself as you get closer to the stage itself and obviously this is the actual stage, the physical square footage. I don't know if uh, Dean can speak to the square footage. That doubled or tripled in size itself. Yeah, it's about 2.5 times larger than the previous stage. Right. All new, if you could see in the background, there's all new the electronics on the bottom right hand corner. And all the, the, they have six rows of back screens now where before right. you just had a curtain and you'd switch lights every now and then. Right. Now they have drop curtains where they can have all these different productions that get moved. It's, it's, right. We had, um, Pet Silva Petroselli had a theatrical consultant come in and, and designed this entire thing to, to be made to, for performance. Our, our right. sound system board is, is second to none. Um, we did training on that. There's kids that are, have been trained. There's been adults that have been trained. Um, so we even reached out to the, the, the program organizations that rent the hall, uh, such as Riley's and such. We had them come in during the training um, so they can utilize the maximum. So it's, it was really an incredible layout and design of this theater. All right. So <clears throat> last space towards is the band area itself. That's a brand new addition as well. It's connected, obviously, to the uh, to the. For five years, I heard the band room better be big enough. The band room better be big enough. And ever since we opened it, we haven't heard one question or concern about the size right. of the band room. The, so apparently, the, it's large enough. But it's a it's a massive right. space. The band room is probably the same size as the Fermi Auditorium. Right. So when they entrusted us, because we kept saying it's going to be big enough. Trust us. It's going to be big enough. Well, yeah. thankfully they did, and we were able to provide it. Like I said, it's that room itself is about the size of 
Fermi's auditorium. Right. So, so that's for the slideshow. So as Randy indicated earlier, uh, typically with every project that I've been involved in, we've been involved in, is at the end of the project, we always plan for close out at the beginning of the job. And there's all the ONMs of the voluminous amount of information that we have to turn over to the school district and the end user to be able to maintain this building. You know, it's a $103 million investment. It is a tremendous amount of equipment that's there. It's about $30 million worth of electrical and mechanical systems. So there's all these ONMs. So on this particular project, we came up with a process. So we have the floor plans of the existing building, of, I'm sorry, for the new building itself. And throughout the building, uh, there are mechanical electrical systems. So we developed this, we used Bluebeam as a baseline for our uh, uh, documents. And actually on this particular project, despite the fact there was 1,200 sheets of drawings, but the entire process was electronic and it was all touch screen. So we developed this software through Bluebeam and basically it's a zoom and a click, if you will. So for example, going right into the Fermi mechanical room, which is, this is portion of it right here, these are the boilers. There are three boilers on the Fermi wing. There's a chiller. There's two chillers, actually. And what we did was we compiled all the information from all the approved submittals, shop drawings, as well as the o and manuals. And all it takes is basically for the individual that's maintaining, looking at this piece of equipment, so, okay, I got chiller number two. I want to look at the o and manuals. And there's the o and manuals for the entire, that's what this unit looks like. So you click on it. It shows you all the operating and maintenance procedures and scheduled maintenance for that particular building and how to order parts and collect all the parts. So this is they can, this particular piece of equipment is worth about $200,000. So maintaining it is key. Right. Brian's going to love this program. So <laughs> then you go on to, for example, you say, okay, I want to go on to the manufacturer's webs. So that's, that didn't. Do you have internet here? The warranty is another piece of it, to click on the warranty so you can actually see the warranty and what's included in the warranty when the warranty expired. Some of these pieces of equipment actually have three to five years, some of them have 10 year warranty. So you go through again and you know what you have. So instead of, so it took about less than 20 seconds to be able to look at this piece of equipment instead of having to pull all the volumes. Now mind you, in a building this size, you'll have 15 to 16 volumes of manuals and binders to be able to sort through them and say, all right, I'm going to look for it. This is all on a thumb drive. You can actually have it on if any. If somebody takes the page out to make a copy and not put it back in the right area, you've got right. 15 manuals to go with, or not put it back at all. Right. And the same thing here. This is the other chill that's worth about $350,000. This one here, again, you go to the owner. This is, how, this is what this unit looks like. This is actually what keeps the cooling in the building, that particular unit right here. It's uh, uh, it's. To get that that thing inside the building, we have to actually leave a large hole in the building to be able to get it in because it's just so large. Um, again, there's also electrical equipment that we looked at and we started developing some of the things that we, you know, if you go to the electrical room itself, it's just a matter of panning through. So this is the electrical room. You look at the transformers there, right? What does this thing look like? So there is all the information that it's a GE unit. It tells you all the product data, the transformers and everything that you have in front of you. All it is is just a click of a mouse that you can fly through the entire building and the switchboard itself, there's your switchboard, all of the information. Again, this is the approved product data that was came with the project. And we've done this on every floor of the project. Uh, you know, you fly through the entire building and be able to you know, go through and pick all of the pieces of equipment in terms of uh, the panel boards, some of the panel boards, the actual breakers, you can get through and it has the project itself, it has the, the as-built, all the panels are listed, all the breakers. So again, it's mechanical plumbing and HVAC systems inclusive of the actual rooftop units that we also looked at and develop those as well to make sure that the end user is able to utilize this data. Again, this is only about five sheets that we compile all this information to be able to give it to the end users and the uh, facility folks to be able to manage their building from a maintenance schedule and whatnot. Now, another thing that when we were talking about doing this, I was worried about program and licensing procedures and all this other stuff. So then they came up with using Bluebeam, which is similar to like a PDF file. Um, there's no ownership, there's no license. Um, so 
it's it's user friendly, which is right. huge. Um, everybody at that at the at the high school have been trained on it. Um, they absolutely love it. Um, this is something that I highly recommend with if Kennedy moves forward or, or virtually any building and that we have any types of renovation um, again this is something that Gilbane developed for this right. one um, but it is something that you can you can do um, so that's just kind of what we wanted to explain and again I'm sure Brian who's more excited about this than you guys were because he <laughs> picks up the first phone call so <laughs> Um, but again, um, we wanted to show you where we are. Um, as a committee, as, as anybody that runs a company or a building or a committee or anything, um, you don't know everything. But my philosophy is I surround myself so together we do. Every committee member on this team um, had subcommittees. Um, they, they, not one of them dropped the ball. I've been doing this for over six and a half years on this project. And there's been a couple other people on this committee that has done the same. Um, we we started when it was pre-ref and worked, and, and we had Dr. Art Pongrantz, which this wouldn't be where it is if it wasn't for that gentleman. Uh, and unfortunately, he will not be able to make the, the ribbon cut, and he's going to be away on vacation. But I just wanted to really just say the committee um, really did above and beyond. Um, and one thing I'm, I'm really impressed on is the, the building committee itself is almost five years old, four and a half years old. Um, nobody left because uh, they just were tired of it. Everybody on the committee made an obligation. They're there for the right reasons. Um, we had one individual who, had, who moved out of town. Um, we've had other that went to the board. Walter went to the board. Uh, Mr. Rippish took on the role that Art did. Um, everybody that started on this building committee, going on four and a half years on the building part of it, is still here. Um, we get so many compliments from the communication subcommittee that we had with Wendy and Gina Sullivan. Um, they would do web postings to keep the public. Anytime there was a town event, um, the apple, I mean the um, the pumpkin festival, the Fourth of July. Uh, we had booths. We constantly kept the public informed. Our biggest thing was transparency. This is the town's building. Uh, everybody that voted for it, overwhelmingly, they voted for it. We felt had a say. Um, so we tried to keep everybody as informed as totally possible. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of man hours put into this from the committee and I just am so proud of, of the committee where they got us or where we are and the website just worked actually on I was able to connect so that's if you can get jump right onto manufacturers website right from here look at that <laughs> <laughs> just the needed Wi-Fi that's all. that's right <laughs> Okay. All right, so I guess with that, we're, we're open for open questions. Open for questions. Answer. Questions? Ed? Great job. Um, just doing and uh, I know about the tunnel because I was the first class to go through there <laughs> 54, <laughs> years, 50 were, 54 years ago, and we did do uh, drills uh, down in the bomb shelter. Wow. Yeah, that's a that's true awesome. story. And um, great. I mean, I got a grandson there, and... Uh, I've been through the whole building. Uh, it's just, I can't imagine, you know, in 1963, when we went in there, we thought that was the state of the art. This thing is above and beyond that. Thanks. Thank Great you. job. Qu Mike. Yeah, thank you for coming. And I, I think it's interesting, other than, other than the word tough, I think what describes Enfield better than anything is the phrase you mentioned, under, ahead of schedule and under budget. That's exactly what Enfield's all about. I think the other thing that you guys did so so well that it doesn't it goes kind of underreported or underappreciated. But if you've had a, a child who went to school there during a, over a year ago when they had the board tunnel there during the winter, how how well your folks worked with the students. So of course the, the administration and the teachers as well. But you know those kids, and I can just tell from my own daughter's personal experience, they took pride in being able to. And only a continue their education, but b excel through adversity. Oh yeah. yeah, isn't that what life is all about? I mean, and so this first graduating class is is really really cool. 
you know, I think it's going to be the graduation that we have in June. It really should be a celebration to what I mean. Obviously, the 13th is going to be a great day, but you know, I think that's the you folks work so well with the students, and our kids are excelling. They didn't. They didn't. There wasn't a, a bump in the road. There wasn't a stop. There wasn't a, a detour. It was just basically they plowed right through. Because again, you folks work great with them, and I think uh, it, it is. It's it's pretty exciting. So again, I mean, great job from everyone involved. It is a great building. I mean, I've been there a number of times. The gym during basketball season was great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Tom. Yeah, wonderful job. Uh, my uh, granddaughter, she just loves it. It, it was just the, everything to her every day she goes to school, which and she says it. Um, but I did get um, with the cafeteria. So it, for people out there really should know this, um, a lot of people thought it was undersized. And you said it's three times its size now. Because of the Eagle Hour, what a lot of people I've had to explain this to, that the, right. the, the, it's a culture thing, that the students had to learn not to go to lunch at one time. Because you have an hour now, they treat you more like a college student, where you're able to use the cafeteria. And what happened at first were all the students were running to the cafeteria for, at the first at one time. So now they're starting to learn slowly and slowly. I, I keep asking my granddaughter about this. They learn to come at different times of the hour and it give them time to go out and do a little, you know, talk uh, to their teachers, their counselors, um, and also there's no study halls. So everything's done in that one hour, and it's really up to the individual to make the best of it. And I think that is phenomenal. I think it really, um, at a young age, they're, they're able to cope with time better, and uh, they're learning, and they're learning to use the cafeteria better, which the, and the culinary classes are just out of, out of the ballpark. Fantastic. Um, yeah, this, uh, the cafeteria falls in the same category as the lobby. You know, five years ago when we designed it, it was designed under the premise that it would be three waves of 600 students. 1,800 was your maximum projected population. So the CAF was designed around a request from the Board of Ed that it have three waves at 600. And again, like that lobby, things change over the course of five years. And you're right, Eagle Hour was a, was a different approach to how a CAF would be used. So it did take a little bit of of a learning curve for the students to ease off for the first five or ten minutes and obviously wait it out. And I, as with uh, typically with all of these types of changes, the students do learn uh, how to manipulate the building and when to use the spaces that are most appropriate for them. So this was just another case of a project of this scale that's designed and built over five years, there's inevitable changes, and this was just another example of those change. Or, or I, a, or I think change, that, that's yes. good for the students, too, to Absolutely. be able to, to adapt. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's, that's what it's all about. And, and that's what the school's designed to do, adapt to their learning um, ability. So that's awesome. A great job, everybody. You know, I've always said this, the, you know, right down to the air conditioning in the, uh, in the uh, gym. Thank you so much. <laughs> After going to Fermi, uh, uh, Fermi graduations in 90-degree heat and seeing people pass out, I think that was the right thing uh, to do when you did it. And you did it with the money that you found and saved. And, again, I'll, every time it I'll It was on you. the value engineering list. Oh, there I, actually I, was I an know, alternate to get rid of that AC. <laughs> so we're glad that it made it back into the project also. Yeah, I remember the first meeting. I, I screamed it out in the, <laughs> inside the meeting. So thank you. Anyone else? Then uh, just on be awesome job. Um, thank you so much. It's been a great team effort. It's great to see Ginny and Wendy in the audience. Um, thank you. Our council liaisons, uh, Donna and Gina, fantastic work bringing information back to us. Whenever something needed to be said, they were on top of it and they informed us. Um, thank you. And I don't think we could have picked um, a better architect, a better um, construction managing company in Silver Petroselli and Gilbane. And jointly, we put together a first class building committee that um, when we met with them on interview time, <laughs> say, Are, do you really want to do this? Um, they all wanted to. And uh, they spoke about their passion of uh, building the best high school uh, in the state of Connecticut, and, and you did it. Um, so we look forward to May 13th. It's going to be a great day to celebrate. But on behalf of the town, to, to each and every one of you here and, and at home, thank you so much for your work on behalf of the town and for our kids. So awesome job. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next item.
on our agenda is public communications and petitions. If there's anyone in the audience wishing to address the council, I would ask that you please raise your hand. I will call on you. Please come forward to the front table. State your name and address for the record. Please keep your comments to no more than five minutes. And we ask that you please refrain from the use of personalities. Mr. Kibbe. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> My name's Kevin Kibbe, 20 School Street. I've just got two things real quick. Um, yeah. I run a Facebook group called the Enfield CT Open Forum, and every fall we do a huge food drive for the Enfield Food Shelf. Um, over the last four years, we've raised so far 6,000 pounds, and we're gonna do that again this fall. But what I wanted to do this off season, because they need help all year long, is um, I wanted to do a monetary drive in order to let them spend the money. I didn't want to do two food drives because at the end it would be counterproductive. Um, our goal was $2,000 where we had just broke, I just checked, we just broke the $1,400 mark. Um, but I know there's a lot of people who are not in the forum who may not know about this, who would like to help the food shelf. Um, they provide an incredible service. I can be reached. My Facebook is the best place to get me. Um, my, my settings are all open, so anybody can contact me. They can see through the Enfield CT Open Forum. Um, again, there's a lot of copycat groups out there, so mine's the one with 14,000 people. Just look for that one, and that's the right one. Um, the other thing I want to do is say thank you again to Mr. Tom Arnone, because Arnone, I'm going to get that right, um, because that whole history of Enfield thing we did was incredible, and it's out on YouTube. Anybody can see it. The best way to get it on YouTube, because I we we would have to pay to get a an actual link to the videos, other than sharing them, is to go to YouTube, put in the search Enfield today, find the channel, and then you'll see we have like 13 or 15 videos so far that we've done and the history of NP history of Enfield part one and two with Mr. Tom Arnone and Bill Friday is available to be seen and you know it's very interesting stuff. So that's it for me. Unless you guys thank you Kevin. Thank you, sir. Good luck. Public communications. Anybody else? All right. We will move to councillor communications. Councillor communications. Anyone? Bill, you've got the house. With on. that, then, um, I'd like to make a motion and suspend the rules this evening and move the following items uh, to miscellaneous and potentially proceed to a vote. Uh, the items tonight, and there are several, um, A1 and A2, uh, B1, 2, 3, and 4, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, and M. Motion by Deputy Mayor Lee, seconded by Councillor Falk. Discussion, show of hands, all those in favor, those opposed, <clears throat> unanimous. Anything else, Bill? Not at this time. Anyone else have anything? I got three quick things, and it will be quick. Um, Thursday night, May 4th, 6 o'clock, Enfield Senior Center, Allied's Attic Fashion Show to support the Enfield Food Show. So if you have some time available, council were in budget discussions, maybe, but um, for the public, this Thursday, May 4th, 6 o'clock, <clears throat> at the Enfield Senior Center. Um, Freedom of Information Act Public Forum, Wednesday, May 10th, 6.30. Again, at the Senior Center in the Great Room. Come out and, and learn about the Freedom of Information Act and how boards and commissions have to operate and how the town uses the Freedom of Information uh, on information, uh, how it gets dis disseminated out to the public, what can be said, what cannot. Um, and finally, as was mentioned earlier uh, by Randy and crew, but the Enfield High School dedication ceremony, Friday, May 13th, starts at 11.30 a.m. Saturday. Saturday. Oh, I'm, did I say Friday? Yes. <laughs> and I have Saturday written down. Saturday, May 13th, 11.30 a.m., a ribbon cutting. <coughs> um, we'll be honoring the building committee. Um, there will be tours. What you saw on the presentation is one thing, but to see it in person is another. Um, so please come out and um, 
come to the ceremony plus uh, take a tour of Enfield High School. And then at 7 o'clock that evening, there's a free concert in that awesome auditorium bringing back uh, entertainers, performers uh, from Enfield in different stages of their successful music careers and uh, should be a fun night as well. Anyone else? Then we'll move to uh, Town Manager Report and Communications, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Included in your packet is the uh, PAR, so I will be more than happy to answer any questions or concerns that you may have regarding uh, the information in that document or on any other subject. Any questions, Mike? Not a question, but uh, you know, Brian, just you know, I, I would just like to encourage our staff to be there on the 18th for the biometrics thing. It's a great, you know, if you really want to get healthier and understand what's going on with your health. Knowing those simple, I think it's five barometric, uh, biometric, uh, you know, readings or metrics is really, uh, it's funny. I, I, you know, we've had to do it at our company. We were forced to do it. You know, you guys are at least giving out gift cards, which is great. You know, but I think it's interesting when you actually learn what your, you know, your triglycerides are and your, you do, con you do subconsciously think about what you eat. Right. So I think I, I would hope, we, I saw the goal of 150 employees and spouses. Hopefully we'd, we can get more. So I just encourage our staff to show up because it really is the first step to understanding your health and to just you know being happier and healthier and again folks in the private sector have been doing it for years and we're still here so again i recommend folks you know showing up i think it's a great great thing to do so just wanted to encourage people our staff to show up so thank you sure red <coughs> i have a <coughs> i have a question on your par uh, and a comment Yes, sir. It says that on the boards and commissions that you're reviewing and so forth. Now, we had a meeting, an executive session, so I'm limited in what I can say. Mm -hmm. But all of those people are appointed by the town council, and nothing has come back on the town council to make the changes. Yet last Thursday at one of the committee meetings, the members of that commission were told as of Monday, May 1st, you're no longer here. You've been done away with it on the committee. And they were offered on another committee, but it's something they couldn't do. Now, it was my understanding none of this would be done until it come back to the council. Yep. Um, in that particular instance, um, a newer employee of the town who staffed that commission was unaware that it was by council appointment that these individuals were on that board and believing that it was within the discretionary authority of effectively my office to make those change made that communication to the committee we have since informed this employee that that is not the case and that those transitions cannot occur until council approves the legislation so I apologize for any confusion, but uh, it, it was um, well intended, but uh, but poorly executed in that that instance. <clears throat> I think that the members of the committee should be contacted and told that. My uh, my apologies. I was under the impression that that had been done. I will make sure that that's done tomorrow. Any other questions, comments for Brian and Red? That's just that's the. Um, Enfield Revitalization yeah. uh, Economic Development. Yeah. Okay. Ed. Yeah, just the public thank you for buildings and grounds. Uh, every time I uh, have some kind of a problem, it's automatically taken care of. I don't know <laughs> how they do it and when, but. You're a heck of a skill. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Which comments? That's right. <laughs> I was going to call on you next. Oh, well, it has nothing to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> Any other uh, questions, comments for our town manager? Go ahead. A couple quick ones. If you and I could have a conversation next week um, about some of the um, traffic monitoring sure. and some, uh, some of the long-term um, corridor issues that involve the, the 190 in the Skidigo area mm -hmm. um, and then there was a couple conversations a year or so ago with um, DPW and we were going to try to get out to um, Connecticut DMV and Connecticut uh, DOT around highway signage and some wayfinding efforts um, if we can revisit that
sometime this summer. Okay. Appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Very good. Thanks, Brian. Next is town attorney report and communication. Chris? Uh, simply, Mr. Mayor, we have a actually a freedom of information hearing we'll be attending on Wednesday afternoon, which has been uh, the fourth in the series. So you have the, you know, theoretical freedom of information that you talk about at a forum, and then you've got freedom of information in action. And that's what we're going through on questions of, in this particular case, what constitutes a public record and what should be released and who's supposed to hold it and who has access to it. So it's really um, a, an act of freedom of information that really is always in flux. So hearing officers will hear it, they'll make a decision, the parties have a right, the whole commission to look at it and say, what do we want to make you know, the law of Connecticut, and then ultimately can go to the courts and they decide. But that's how freedom of information is decided. So I think it's really timely um, with the cases we have uh, down there, and then also to hear from their um, public information officer, Mr. Hennick, who has decades of experience to cover everything you said, Mr. Mayor. And we've really talked about getting the information out there. We've made a great effort to remind people to send it out. The manager has to staff, so we'd both get our employees um, in the town, but also citizens. And Mr. Lee, a surrounding community, had asked if they could attend, and we sent it out to East Windsor, Summers, and Suffield to them to say, hey, if you want to come and take advantage of this, um, we're going to be hosting it. So hopefully we'll get a good turnout. If we don't, it's not for lack of trying. It may just be the nice uh, <laughs> spring weather that people have other things to do and want to break out the barbecue. But hopefully we'll get some good response because it is, it's, it's a very interesting uh, part of the law, and it really ensures open and transparent government. So... We did the best we could, and we'll see how it goes. We'll report back at the next meeting. Great. Thank you, Chris. Questions for Chris? Bill. Could, first of all, thanks for getting back to me on a couple of the issues this week. Can, can you take a moment and give us a synopsis of what occurred in the couple of the court cases? I know there's some media coverage late last week maybe about, um, I don't know if it was summary judgment or some kind of action had been announced. My reading old newspapers I don't know I know that some of that was brought forward by counsel to the council since then I don't know if you're regarding the the lawsuits in regard to the police department yeah yeah, I, there were some favorable summary judgments in regard to a couple of the lawsuits that um, portions of those cases, and there was a very, I will just uh, endorse to you uh, an article written by the J.I., uh, Will Healy, who really covered it, I think, very appropriately, uh, fairly and reasonably, that actually discussed it in detail, and he's done articles on it from the beginning, and I think that was probably the most informative um, piece that you could look at that really discusses what the summary judgments were, what the impact of them uh, were, and, and comments by the police and the other side, but really showed that in Enfield, because of the CALEA, which is the national accreditation, and the standards that they have within the department, that a lot of claims were dismissed to say that this was more of a pattern, that it was something that was you know going on as a result of either lack of training or by uh, lack of supervision, which is very important to a town. So it, it it can be complicated on the face of it, but in the real practicality, it showed a federal judge very strongly, and this isn't the first time, um, really looking at it. And you don't get that all the time. You sometimes just have, as we see cases are settled, and we have to wait, and sometimes people don't get as much information as they, as they would like at that time. But these are sort of a, I think, a look into the inner workings of those cases and really, uh, you know, both sides having had opportunity to orally argue before a federal judge and then brief the issues. And then, uh, you know, long, I think some, I think one of the decisions was 26 pages. But uh, I think it was very favorable for, for the town. It should give people confidence in the oversight, the review, um, what the department had done in the past, um, despite, again, sometimes cases are settled and people don't get the full import. Cases are settled for a lot of reasons. Doesn't mean because there was any wrongdoing. A lot of cases are settled just because the insurance company says, you know, it's too costly and it's a business decision. So I won't get into that, but I think this gives sort of pulls the curtain back and actually talks about some of the facts of the cases. But again, um, I think it was a very, very insightful article that Mr. Healy did, and I would endorse it to anybody at home. I believe it was Friday before last, um, but... Sometime last week. Yeah, sometime <laughs> last week. But I would say go on and Google it and look if you have any interest in it. I think it was a, a very uh, careful analysis of those decisions. And the decisions are out in the yes, public domain as well? Okay. they are. Good. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you for the question. Any other questions for Chris? Thanks, Chris. 
<clears throat> uh, next, reports to special committees of the council. Uh, anything from Don or Jean on Enfield High School? We've heard an okay. Um, so next, we have the JFK pre-referendum committee. <coughs> Chris Rutledge is here. Who's going to join you up here, Chris? Uh, Mr. Salgarski and <coughs> Dean. Or, right. And Dean and Chris. <coughs> Mentos? Yeah, Mentos. There you go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> go with go with her. All right. Well, you're setting up. I'm oh, sorry. Um, is this on? It is. Yep. All right. Very good. Good evening. Um, my name is uh, Chris Rutledge, chair of the JFK Pre-Referendum Committee. I'm here tonight with uh, Mr. Chris Nardi to my left from Silver Petroselli and Associates, and to my right is Mr. Steven Sargalski, the JFK principal. Um, I know it's been a little bit since my last update. A lot of that has been because uh, we've been engaged in a very, uh, very fluid process where it, it seemed almost uh, every week when we'd meet, as soon as we'd update one thing, there would be new updates that were given to that. Um, so we've been working very diligently trying to meet some of the state requirements that Mr. Nardi will go into a little bit more in a minute. Um, at our last meeting, we hit a critical milestone. We approved a conceptual design that can now be used to go to the state to follow the uh, to follow their conceptual design approval and their reimbursement approval processes. Um, I want to for I also probably most importantly, I want to commend the work done by the committee up to this point. Um, I think the, gr the group has definitely come together. They have been thoughtful. They've been considerate in their decision making. They've tried to examine this from a multitude of perspectives, um, including the needs of the community and, of course, the needs of the educators and the students, um, while also at the same time doing our very best to be cost conscious. Um, so at this point, um, with that being said, I'll uh, hand it over to Mr. Nardi, who can talk more about the actual design and the uh, state reimbursement uh, guidelines and the process that's to come. Thank you. I'm Chris Nardi with Silver Petroselli. And just to give you all an update on where we stand in terms of the Connecticut space standards, I. I'm sure Tom has been filling you in as, as we go along with the demographics, but um, the committee had commissioned MMI through Silver Petroselli. Um, MMI is Malone and McBroom. They do civil engineering as well as demographic studies. So the committee had commissioned them to do a demographic study, which would need to be done as part of any new school construction project in the state of Connecticut when you file for the grant application. And previously, the last study we had showed a highest projected enrollment at the middle school of 1,138 students. You're allowed to use the highest projected enrollment over an eight-year period to size your building. Um, the new demographic study that we got from MMI came back with the highest projected enrollment of 1,215 students. So we went from 1,138 to 1,215, which allowed us to add a lot more square footage to the building that would be reimbursed at the town's full 70 plus percent rate. Um, so you can see on the monitor, the total allowable square footage, that is through the state's calculation based on your student enrollment and the grades that you carry. We can build up to 197,640 gross square feet of educational space and you would be fully reimbursed for all that under a renovate as new construction. The plan that I'm going to show you momentarily um, is totaled at 215,000 square feet. So just based on that, we're about 18,000 over. But if you go down to the next two line items, the pool and its mechanical equipment room, 
and the auditorium and the support spaces for the auditorium. So that would be stage, dressing rooms, stage storage. Um, those spaces are not viewed as reimbursable items at the state for a middle school. The state does not recognize auditoriums and their middle school calculations for square footages, and they don't recognize pools traditionally, and especially since this pool is town use, um, it would not be reimbursed. So those two areas would need to be paid 100% by the town. But if we reduce those square footages from our 215,000, it leaves us with 100, about 197,500 gross square feet of educational space. So looking apples to apples, our educational space is within the school space standards. And we would be fully reimbursed the 70% for those areas. The pool and the auditorium would not be reimbursed under any condition. <coughs> And since those are above the 197,000, it's really irrelevant to the conversation. Um, the town would be paying for it either way. But I just wanted to throw that out there. So when you see the 215,000, I don't want anyone to think that you're getting dinged on the reimbursement. You're getting the maximum <laughs> reimbursement the town can get for its educational spaces in this building as the plan is laid out right now. Does that make sense? Now I can go into as much or as little detail as, as you'd like in this plan. Um, I'll start with, I guess, a little bit less detail. And then you tell me if, if you want me to expand on any areas. Um, basically looking at two floors, on the left-hand side is the main level, on the right-hand side is the second or, or upper level. The three academic red, white, and blue wings, um, which are really colored as such, those academic wings are slated to remain with small additions built on the end of each. Those would be two-story additions. And really, one of the main focus in programming this with the educators and with the central office is um, a year or two ago, the middle school was a 12, ran a 12-team grade system About five, years. five years ago. And then they had to cut back to 11. With the projected enrollments increasing over the coming years, they anticipate the need to go back to a 12-team system. So we're looking at adding basically one extra classroom per department, so an extra social studies, an extra science, an extra math, an extra English, um, to get from that 11 to 12 team. So one of the critical needs is more classroom space in this building. Another critical need are the world language classrooms, which currently are located in the three portables outside. There is a need to get those portable classrooms inside the building, hard construction, so that those students are in the same environment as, as all the other students. Um, also in this plan at the bottom, the administrative wing and media center, there would really be minimal renovation to that area as we show. It's, it's a relatively new space with the media center and a lot of renovation was done in the admin wing during that media center project. So we're trying not to, to touch that. We are looking at adding canopies out front, which are the dashed lines, which is just an area for students to wait as mom and dad drop off or pick up or the buses come. It's something that's, that's lacking at the school currently. In terms of the cafeteria and kitchen wing on the right hand side, we'd be looking at adding square footage to both those spaces, um, going from a four line to a five line servery in the kitchen. And then the cafeteria, we'd be re reducing the lunch waves and in also increasing the student population. So we'd be in need for more seats within that cafeteria. What you see in the upper part of the screen um, labeled as pool and the locker rooms, that is the existing pool and locker room structure. We're not building a new pool. That's so the green area? That's the green area, correct. Uh, the rectangular area kind of directly to the upper part of the screen. Can you move these? I can, yeah, I can point yeah. to that. So that pool and the locker rooms would stay. Obviously, the locker rooms would be fully renovated. The Project Adventure is an addition um, built off the back end of the locker room. Currently, Project Adventure takes place in a th one of the third spaces of the existing gym that's get subdivided. It's um, part of the PE academic program and it's extremely popular with, with the students. Um, what we would be looking at doing is demolishing the gymnasium portion of that building, 
also demolishing the shop wing of the existing school and then rebuilding that as, as shown here. So a new gym with larger teaching spaces, new health classrooms, music classrooms, new music program areas, including a band room. The band students currently practice and run their classes off of the auditorium stage. So a dedicated band room, um, new orchestra and chorus rooms, which currently exist, but we would be restructuring those. And then one of the um, big discussions that took place at the committee level was the auditorium, which currently exists in the hub in the middle here, that courtyard area. Um, the auditorium's undersized. It's really in awful shape. If you go in, most of the seats, the upholstery is falling off. You can see the springs popping out of the seats. And it doesn't meet ADA in terms of the slope of, of the pitch of the slab. Uh, you can't fit the students on the stage. It's often overcrowded for presentations. Yeah, they use the stage extensions um, to get the to add stage area. <laughs> and looking at that geometry <laughs> of of the circle and the hub, it's really a difficult build to try and expand the auditorium in that location. We can't go out in any direction because we'd be limited. Um, by that hub and that circular corridor that really connects the entire school. So a decision was made by the committee that the auditorium should be larger. Right now it seats about 450 to 500 um, spectators. The new auditorium we're looking at about 625 seats with a stage that's almost double in size. So the only solution really that made a lot of sense was to rebuild the auditorium in a new location. And as part of that decision, um, the decision was made because the hub is such an odd space. There are a bunch of classrooms in there that are segmented pieces of pies with curved walls and, and it's really not great learning spaces. If, if we're going to be taking down the greater majority of that era, we looked at giving it back just as courtyard space. Um, one, it won't be counted towards the space standards because it's exterior. And two, we can be more efficient replacing those classrooms elsewhere in the building with more pure rectangular or square geometries than, than pie wedges and, and pie shapes. So it's kind of a, a dramatic change, but something that, that we looked at different options and this was the preferred option. Also looking at new, a new tech ed classroom wing and art classrooms, computer tech, and family and consumer science rooms. So basically from this pinkish red tech ed, up to the gymnasium right outside the pool. That is all new addition. We'd also be looking at the additions at the end of each academic wing. And other than that, it's, it's really essentially renovating um, the school in place. So I probably took longer than I wanted to, but I'd be certainly happy to answer any additional questions that you guys may have. Questions, comments for? Tom? Yeah, so on the demographics, which uh, I know the committee caught a, a fact uh, that we missed uh, during it, uh, that uh, a lot of correct schools now are, are eliminating middle school, uh, including the safety uh, um, school right here in town. So, you know, somebody, they brought it up in, in committee and, and, you know, the demographic study came through and said, yeah, not only are we going to get an uptick in, in correct students, but we may also get an uptick in people not wanting to go to correct because like the high school, once we have a new facility, it actually draws students back to Enfield. So I think we're prepared for that with this design, which is very important. It's tight, but it's not tight um, to the fact that if we need to expand back to 12, uh, we were able to do it. So I think the committee felt very comfortable in this design is not being too extravagant, but yet being just what Enfield needs. So I, I love it. I think it's a, a phenomenal uh, effort from the committee, and I thank them and staff uh, from schools, from the school department too, also giving us a guidance in, in uh, uh, how to pick these classrooms. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to uh, start bringing this out to the voter. And, uh, you know, going out, we're going to have this up on websites, I would imagine. People could take a look at it. Uh, in the future, if we could. Um, yes, very near future. So thank you. Great job. Questions, comments? Bill. At, at what, I know one of the discussions early on about, about the 
the renovation in general was that it was also going to encompass the athletic fields and yes that that right. is included point in in looking at this it looks like there's going to be some notable site plan impacts as well when will you have a concept of that do you want to take that up? sure yeah so we have a civil engineer on our team um and really what we wanted to do is lock down the footprint of the building before we released them to go and, and develop their schematic site plans or conceptual site plans that work with this building. So um, this plan actually just kind of was generated this afternoon after our Wednesday meeting last week and making the changes that we talked about at the committee level. So my plan was tomorrow to send this off to the civil engineer um, as long as we're all in agreement up here and then I would think within a week and a half or so, um, hopefully by our meeting on, yeah, a week and a half from today, I would hope to see some early site plan developments okay. for this project. And there had been some discussion, I, I guess, as it relates to the pool being a, a town use facility that there might be, it might become an accessible space from the outside of, of the school community. Is that something that is illustrated yet or um it's not it's not depicted uh really graphically on this plan if, okay. if that is a desire i think programmatically and in terms of construction we we can make it happen um it's located on the exterior of, of a building so we can certainly give it a designated entrance that would be for public use only the one of the difficulties is um it's really integrated with the locker rooms right now yeah. Yeah. and how we would segregate those two areas uh, might be a bit of a challenge but we could make it work but it hasn't that decision hasn't been formally made at a committee level okay thank you mike so any athletic fields does that include the, the courts the tennis courts basketball court and for example you, the out the, the curbing of the building is in tough tough shape yeah, fact, it, it's probably dangerous. It includes repaving, recurbing, athletic fields, tennis courts, basketball courts, lighting, lighting, is signage. It, is it is it possible that so you mentioned so what was your sampling of the demographic study? Can we get a copy of that too as well? I'm just curious what what you actually what what did you, what did you measure? And can we get a copy of it? Um, yeah, absolutely. We can send you a copy. I'm I'm not the expert. Um, MMI they run all sorts of formulas and, and they look. Gosh, it all sorts of, they looked at the casino um, impact. There are studies pretty much for any residential or commercial development in this area. So they're looking at all those impact studies as to what it may mean for the town of Enfield, what it may mean for the student population. They look at the populations of the grades coming up. They look at the magnet schools and how many students are leaving this district and coming back to this district every year so it, it's really a, a complex formula of many different factors that'd be, absolutely that'd be great thanks yeah. yeah i can i could if you don't mind i can send that out tonight to if anybody everybody wants it i'll send it out this evening further questions comments all right gentlemen thank you very much uh again thanks to the committee um serving as one of the liaisons it's been um it's been a long road and it's it's a tough design building um but um you met your charge um you really honed in on to the reimbursable square footage mm -hmm. um and you listened to the commentary from folks saying it's vital that we keep the public spaces right. uh, the pool and and a larger gymnasium and a larger auditorium um so you know working with uh fellow counselors and board members and the committee i really liked how in the end the group gelled and really got focused on uh developing you know the best middle school that we can keeping it all at in within the re the reimbursable levels so again thank you very much thank you very much <clears throat> Okay, any other reports of special committees of the council? <coughs> <laughs> so with none there, we will try to fly. How's that, Gina? All right. All right. Gina's hungry. So listen to me, like when I need a, a motion yes. in a second and a close of nominations. <laughs> All right, done.
focus here. All right, so, and actually we skip all the way to miscellaneous because all items have been moved uh, to miscellaneous. So first item would be the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda by Councillor Sakala? Seconded by Councillor Bosco. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Those two transfers or surplus property is one. Sensing none, by a show of hands, all those in favor? Those opposed? Unanimous. Appointments, uh, town council next. And they're all Enfield Culture and Art. So item number one. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to um, put into nomination Shannon Esslinger to reappointment to the Enfield Cultural and Arts Commission. By Deputy Mayor Lee, seconded by Councilor Sakala. Is there a motion to close by Councilor Suzak, seconded by Councilor Bosco, by a show of hands, all those in favor? Those opposed? Nominations are closed. Discussion? Sensing none. Roll call, please. Councillor Suzak? Shannon Esslinger? Councillor Arnone? Four. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Sakala? Shannon Esslinger? Councillor Davis? Four. Councillor Denny? Four. Councillor Edgar? Four. Councillor Falk? Shannon Esslinger? Mayor Copen? Four. Deputy Mayor Lee? Four. Councillor Ludwig? Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Item two? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to place into nomination the name of Marguerite French for uh, reappointment to the Enfield Culture and Arts Commission. Second. By yeah. Deputy Mayor Lee, seconded by Councillor Arnone. Motion to close by Councillor Suzak, Second. seconded by Councillor Denny. By a show of hands, all those in favor? Those opposed? Nominations are closed. Discussion? Roll call. Councillor Suzak? Marguerite French? Councillor Arnone? Four. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Sakala? Marguerite French? Councillor Davis? Four. Councillor Denny? Four. Councillor Edgar? Four. Councillor Falk? Marguerite French? Mayor Copen? Four. Deputy Mayor Lee? Four. Councillor Ludwig? Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Item three. I'd like to nominate Donna Hamry. So moved. By Councillor Arnone, seconded by Councillor Ludwig. Motion to close by Councillor Sakala, seconded by Councillor Denny. By show of hands, all those in favor, those opposed. Nominations are closed. Okay. Discussion. Roll call, please. Councillor Suzak. Donna Hamray. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Donna Hamray. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Edgar. Four. Councillor Falk. Donna Hamry. Mayor Copen. Four. Deputy Mayor. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. And item four. I would like to nominate Emily McIntosh. By Councillor Arnone, seconded by Councillor <coughs> Suzak. Motion to close nominations by Councillor Sakala, seconded by Councillor Davis. By a show of hands, all those in favor, those opposed. <laughs> nominations are closed. Discussion, sensing none. Roll call, please. Councillor Suzak. Emily McIntosh. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Emily McIntosh. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Edgar. Four. Councillor Fall. Emily McIntosh. Mayor Copen. Four. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. And Councillor Ludwig. Four. Those in favor, none against, and no abstentions. All right, next item, discussion resolution, request for transfer funds for public works, highway division, $6,332.50. Resolve that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter, the following transfer is hereby made to DPW Highway Division, overtime 6,332.50 from DPW Highway Division Snow Plow Contractors, 6,332.50. Certified the funds are available. John Wilcox, Director of Finance. So moved. By Councillor Falk, seconded by Deputy Mayor Lee. Discussion? Sensing none, roll call, please. Councillor Suzak? Four. Councillor Ludwig? I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. That's Councilor okay, four. <laughs> I knew where we were going. <laughs> Councillor Vasca. Four. Councillor Sakala. Here. Four. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Present. Four. <laughs> Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Edgar. Four. Councillor Falk. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. And Councillor Ludwig. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Next item, discussion resolution, request for transfer of funds for capital improvement project $100,000. Resolved that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F <coughs> of the Town Charter, the following transfer is hereby made to capital and non-reoccurring CNR, Town Road Paving, Construction $100,000. 
from capital and non-recurring CIP fund reserve fiscal year 2016-2017 other revenue $40,000 CNR EMS facility upgrade construction 16,000 CNR buses vans slash vehicles $44,000 certified the funds are available John Wilcox director of finance so moved. Second. moved by Councillor Arnone seconded by Councillor Falk discussion no any discussion sensing none question that's Catalina Drive right yes, correct well I think the public should know that we're doing 100,000 but 40,000 is going to be given by the water company back to that right. mm -hmm. so the entire thing is not from town funds which brings right. up another question go ahead Bill when that uh, when that <coughs> payment from the utility arrives where does that go does it go back to one of these sources or does it go back to fund balance at that point I would have to ask uh, the finance director how he intends to deposit that revenue okay so no nope. can follow no up for you yeah okay any other questions roll call please Councillor Suzak four Councillor Arnone four Councillor Bosco four Councillor Sakala four Councillor Davis four Councillor Denny four Councillor Edgar four Councillor Falk four Mayor Copen four Deputy Mayor Lee four Councillor Ludwig four there's 11 in favor none against and no abstentions next item discussion resolution request for transfer of funds for public works fifty one thousand dollars Resolved that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter, the following transfers hereby made to capital and non reoccurring architectural and engineering other professional services $51,000 from capital and non reoccurring CNR light med vehicle $13,526, CNR heavy duty trucks $19,328, CNR buses, vans vehicles 12,452 and CNR autos non-public safety 5,694 certified the funds are available John Wilcox <coughs> director of finance so moved by Councillor Arnone second seconded by Councillor Denny discussion roll call please Councillor Suzak four Councillor Arnone four Councillor Bosco four Councillor Sakala four Councillor Davis four Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Edgar. Four. Councillor Falk. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Next item discussion resolution resolution authorizing the town manager to enter into an agreement with Construction Solutions Group. Whereas the John F. Kennedy pre-referendum committee is seeking to apply for a SCG-049 grant to fund certain costs associated with the future John F. Kennedy Middle School project, and whereas the town wishes to retain Construction Solutions Group LLC as the owner's agent with respect to the attached agreement to apply for a grant, Resolve that the town manager Brian R. H. Chadkowski is empowered to enter into the attached agreement subject to review and approval by the town attorney in the name and on behalf of the town of Enfield with Construction Solutions Group LLC. So moved. By Councillor Arnone, seconded by Councillor Sakala. Discussion? Bill? Brian, this is the this is the process that secures the reimbursement rate that the town might be eligible for? Yes, sir. This is, um, as it has been explained to me, this is the application for that 70% um, reimbursement uh, from the state, and that application has to be made by um, an entity other than the architect of record who is preparing ah. the, uh, the preliminary, uh, the preliminary um, construction scope and estimates. Thank you. Sure. Red? So actually, this is an extra expenditure from the original amount. That is correct. This was not an expense that was originally anticipated as part of the JFK committee budget. Okay, and we're going out to under so we don't have to bid for it. That is correct because it's below the $15,000 threshold. We are not required to bid. Okay, and a language question. It says subject to the approval by the town attorney. If he's already approved it, it should say it's approved by the town attorney. Which is which? 
Massachusetts? Well, I think that's probably the standard language they use. It will be subject to my final review, but I've already reviewed it. And as the manager said, we've approved it, and it's just a two-page proposal. It is under the uh, limit, but it's subject to our ultimate approval, so I guess it's six and one half. Sometimes they come in after Mr. Edgar and we review them, and sometimes, such as this one, it's a short and we get it and we review it, review it first. So I can tell you it has been approved. It has been approved. Yes. Tom? And I just, just to remind all of us here also that 70% reimbursement is um, we really have to make these deadlines. Uh, it's changing daily. Uh, we've been warned uh, several times by the engineering uh, company that they, when they go no negotiate with other schools that uh, things change and, and percentage change uh, quickly. So we're trying to stay on that on that steady road to have this approved and, and lock in on those uh, those reimbursement rates. Donna? Just a reminder, this is what Art Pomerantz used to do when he worked for the Board of Ed and was the facilities manager there. And this is when Matt hired Art. This was something that Art performed for the Enfield High. So and that's, I believe, the EDO 49, and that's signed by the Board of Ed. Further questions, comments? Sensing none, roll call, please. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Edgar. Abstain. Councillor Falk. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. And Councillor Ludwig. Four. Ten in favor, one abstention, no one against. Next item, discussion resolution, resolution waiving bids for PCB remediation at John F. Kennedy Middle School. Whereas air quality testing is necessary at the John F. Kennedy Middle School because evaluated levels of PCBs have been detected. And whereas the testing will help determine the costs associated with an EPA mandated PCB management plan. And whereas some costs associated with the management plan will be eligible for up to 70% reimbursement under a state SCG-049 grant, which grant applications are due no later than June 30th, 2017. And whereas the preparation time to properly solicit public bids would surpass the deadline, resolve that the town council does hereby find based on the foregoing compelling public interest and in accordance with chapter five, section eight D, that it is therefore against the best interest of the town to solicit bids. So moved. By Deputy Mayor Lee, seconded by Councilor Suzak. Discussion? Red? It says some costs may approve, which which will, but which won't. So at this point in time, I can't answer that question from the standpoint that we don't know what the extent of the PCB issue is. Um, but there are things like, uh, for instance, it's possible that PCBs have migrated into the masonry in and around the windows. The replacement of that masonry would be subject to that 70% reimbursement. But there are other elements that might not necessarily be eligible for that reimbursement expense provided we can incorporate that with the, um, uh, with the uh, CSG uh, application. So at this point in time, I can't tell you exactly what potential expenses could be eligible for that reimbursement, only from the standpoint we don't know the extent of the problem uh, with the PCBs. So until we can define that, we're not in a position to be able to answer that question with any great, great accuracy, excuse me. Can you tell me why this is a must for a waiver? So in this instance, we have to provide for the air quality testing so that we can then talk with DEEP and we can also talk with the US EPA on a management plan. And those discussions have to occur in advance of the deadline so that we can include costs from that plan in the SCG uh, application. So in essence, you tell me that, that it's a timeline issue. Yes, sir. Tom? So although they're elevated, the 
We've seen some examples in the state that were much, 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 much more higher than what this school particularly can't has at, at this point. So it's not, um, it's uh, something we need to do quickly, but it's uh, not the worst case scenario. It's, it's on the lower level of that. For anybody that don't, uh, is not familiar with PCBs, they were, it was added to caulking that they caulked windows with. It was, uh, you know, and then every window is caulked that way. Every door is caulked that way. And you know, the caulk it, uh, deteriorates over the years and falls down. And, and the, the problem with it, it can't be cleaned under, re under newer regulations. And this is really more, uh, these regulations are newer uh, uh, for PCBs, so, so uh, they have to be removed and can't be cleaned. Luckily, the high school was built in an era where they didn't use them. Uh, unfortunately, the middle school was in the, the 70s or so, late 60s or 70s, that they use them quite often. So it's not, um, it's not a, uh, by any means a game changer. It's just a precaution. Um, and uh, hopefully our air quality will be, will be fine. But we'll know, and, and this needs to be done and quickly. Ed? Yeah, I think maybe my question would be to the town attorney if by by voting on this uh non-bid thing is this in uh, the best interest of the town like for example this unisource uh gas line or, or yes, yes or no? i think this is a very good example of how it should be done that after our discussions the manager at the end of the week this was he, this information came to him he came down to my office we actually sat he had this information he gave us the bullet points because he understood we needed to have a compelling interest um, to establish that it was against the best interest of the town. So gleaning that, we were comfortable with it. We wrote the resolution, and as I said to the mayor, that way it's contained there. So if somebody looks at that document, they understand what the thinking was and why it was compelling. And as Mr. Um, Edgar elicited, it's because of the time frame. You could lose the reimbursement. So that is a valid and compelling reason. And I think this is a good example of working hand in glove. Um, and we know what time is of the essence on it, and we work together, and we did it the right way. So you have a comfort level. People at home have a comfort level. And if anybody looks at the resolution, they understand exactly why the town did it. So, yeah, I think the, the system um, worked perfectly well on this. It's your ultimate determination to make it, not mine or Matt's. But I'm comfortable. I'm not raising any red flags. And Brian. Brian. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, you see? You're uh, in the zone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we would raise the red flag, but we already well vetted it with Brian, and we're very comfortable <laughs> with the reasoning for it. So you'll make the you obviously have to decide that it is, but I'm comfortable with it from a legal point of view. Okay, thanks. I I, I really wanted the public to hear. Well, I think that's why I, going forward, there's a comfort level when you do do it. You're going to know that the reasoning is contained in that that we've looked at it. It's been. Um, uh, vetted legally, so I think it passes muster, but ultimately you are the final arbiters uh, to make that finding, but we'll always give you our guidance and so will Brian. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Sensing none, roll call please. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. <laughs> Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Edgar. Against. Councillor Falk. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Four. There's ten in favor, one against, and no abstentions. Next item, discussion resolution. Resolution to approve rates of pay for seasonal and or temporary employees. Resolved that in accordance with Chapter 5, Section 14 <coughs> of the Town Charter, the rates of pay for certain summer, seasonal, temporary, and other listed employees working in various <coughs> departments throughout the town will be increased according to the attached schedule effective July 1, 2017. So moved. By Councillor okay. Falk, seconded by <laughs> Councillor Arnone. Discussion? Lifeguards. For any lifeguards out there, now they get a little raise, <laughs> we really need lifeguards for the summer program. So go down to the uh, Recreation Department and apply with, uh, apply with at Mary, uh, from Mary Keller, and uh, hopefully somebody out there can do it. Any further discussion, comments? Sensing none, roll call, please. Councillor Suzak? Four. Councillor Arnone? Four. Councillor Bosco is out. Councillor Sakala? Four. Councillor Davis? Four. Councillor Denny? Four. Councillor Edgar? Four. Councillor Fall? Four. Mayor Copen? Four. Deputy Mayor Lee? Four. Councillor Ludwig? Stain. 
I'm in favor, no one against, and one abstention. Next item, discussion resolution. Resolution granting a license to the Thompsonville Fire Department. Whereas the Thompsonville Fire Department desires to erect a fence on town-owned property, now therefore be it resolved that the town of Enfield does hereby provide the Thompsonville Fire Department with a license to erect a fence on town-owned land <coughs> in accordance with the terms and conditions attached hereto as reviewed and approved by the town attorney. Be it further resolved that town manager Brian R.H. Chadkowski is authorized to sign the license in the name and on behalf of the town of Enfield. So moved. By Deputy Thank Mayor you. Lee, seconded by Councillor Falk. Discussion? Ed? Again, uh, I just want to make sure that now we're not going to be liable for this fence and we're not going to be able to uh, be liable to maintain it. No, and to uh, Councilman Eggers' point, we did already review this and approve it. We had gone back and forth as late as Friday with their attorney for certain changes, and we've um, written it to protect the town from that. It's their responsibility. To, they're going to actually have to apply to planning and zoning. They have to maintain it, keep repairs. It's for a set time of 15 years, and at the end of it, this will expire. They can renegotiate it with the manager. What I was concerned about while we put a time, I, I didn't want an eyesore to develop. I know I, I trust the fire department wouldn't want that in their own backyard. This addresses it, that all of a sudden we don't come back and it, it looks like hell, because most of these fences don't work, last longer than that. And by the way, we also put in um, that the style of the, of the fence and those particulars and the type of material are subject to the town manager's, town manager's approval. Again, to have that, uh, because it is close to us as well. So I think we've addressed all of the main uh, concerns about repair and maintenance. And again, in 15 years, it expires at their cost. They have to remove it or we will and we'll build them. So they're good neighbors, but I think good tight agreements make for good neighbors in the future. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else further? Sensing none, roll call, please. Councilor Susan. Four. <coughs> Councilor Arnone. Four. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Davis. Four. Councilor Denny. Four. Councilor Edgar. Four. Councilor Falk. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. Councilor Ludwig. Four. Mayor 11 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Next item, discussion resolution. Resolution to provide grant funding to the Hazaville Institute Conservancy Society. Whereas the Hazaville Institute Conservancy Society has requested grant funding to make improvements to the Hazaville Institute, and whereas the town of Enfield is desirous to have said improvements made, now therefore be it resolved that the town of Enfield does hereby provide the Hazaville Institute Conservancy Society with grant funds in the amount of $300,000 in accordance with the terms and conditions attached hereto as reviewed and approved by the town attorney. Be it further resolved that the town manager, Brian R. H. Chadkowski, is authorized to sign the grant in the name and on behalf of the town of Enfield. So moved. By Councillor Falk, seconded by. Second. Councillor Suzak, discussion. Mr. Mayor, perhaps a preemptive strike. I'll just add that we, the conditions and approval we have made, we've been reviewing this for several months. We sat with the manager during last week, ironed out the final um, changes and amendments, which I think were important um, to the town, and we'll let the project move forward. But again, ensure us in all the ways in the prior agreements under the leases um, for the grant and, and the uh, license that's going to come. So I just want you to know that we, we reviewed it and we've approved it. And this is grant funds that were allocated by the council in a previous budget, but this formalizes the process Correct. of obtaining the funds. Red? Yes, question. Are the funds going to be given them completely at once, or are you going to give it piecemeal as they spend it? Um, the agreement calls for the funds to be moved to an escrow account under the town's sole control and that we will distribute funds when we are provided the appropriate documentation to release those funds. Any further questions, comments? Sensing, go, Liz? If you could just say, so the grant is from Enfield taxpayers though, out of our tax budget, right? From the previous, it's not a grant from the federal government? Correct, that and is correct. I just, I just wanted to recap because I was reading it and then it says to park on the property by it to have permission? Can someone explain that? 
like what does that quite mean? It said, you know, of what it's saying on it. Um, are, Store with, equipment. Oh, uh, that's with respect to the license agreement, which is the next legislative item. Um, the um, the physical footprint of the um, of the property on which the conservancy sits is relatively small. So in order to be able to have the appropriate equipment and materials close by for the project, the um, conservancy is asking to temporarily use some town property located nearby, which um, most people here might know as the sign shop or the uh, wood shop. Wood shop. Wood shop. So uh, that's what that license is for, is to enable them to have access to that property and use that property that the town owns that's, uh, that's close by for those purposes. Okay. And does it, because it says the scope, does it say like what's being done? Like um, I don't recall. Um, it's been, we've had so many different drafts back and forth. Bill, Bill. The, the, um, the scope of the work is essentially the addition of the, um, basically an elevator tower, or actually it's not, a, it's, a, it's a lift tower and a stairway in order to make the building fully, uh, code compliant and the addition of a restroom on each floor to um, expand the number of code required restrooms uh, for the property and it's being built off the back of the building and and so it's the back question. of the building actually abuts the plaza's parking lot the so that whole parking right. lot behind the conservancy and the plaza is owned by the plaza so the Hazabel Institute basically sits on its own square with a little little space behind where the addition would be built. And the parking that Brian mentioned is actually across the Conservancy's parking lot. It used to be an old oil company, correct? State Line mm -hmm. Oil. State Line Oil. And um, so it's a basically a gravel or grass lot with a building um, that's be further behind the parking, the back parking area of the plaza. Okay, and just one, one more. And what is the building going to be used for? The building, um, well, the, when, they, when the state um, contributed uh, some money about 10 years ago, the, the town entered into an agreement for that grant that, and it's actually in keeping with the deed of the property, um, that there has to be a, a public and civic use for the building. Um, at least in part. So currently that, that, um, that deed restriction that the state has added on top of the, the existing Hazardville Institute deed has um, at least, I think, 50% of the property has to be publicly accessible for civic, educational, or cultural use. Um, one of the concepts that, that we continue to explore with the um, probate court district is whether that satisfies um, the various towns in the district by bringing the, the court um, further uh, to the east up 190. That was envisioned back when the probate court district was established. Um, so we've, we've created some concepts from them and depending on how far we get into, into the project towards completion with this grant, um, we, would, we would seek to further that concept with them and see if that could be something they could occupy uh, about two years time, which coincidentally would be about the 150th anniversary of the opening of the property. Okay, thanks. I just want to hear it and Mr. Mayor, I think it would be important to note the reason this was able to be done, the town money going to this, is because it is a town-owned building. There is a long lease, but these improvements ultimately, when the building reverts back to the town, if the lease isn't extended, they, it is improvement to a town building, the elevator and these bathrooms. So it is ultimately Enfield taxpayer money being used for an Enfield building. And if I could, Scott, one of the, one of the, one of the reasons why this took... Um, extended time to, to get organized I th and I think it's to everyone's benefit on, on both sides of the agreement is that we're, we're tr attempted to mimic um, what the state of Connecticut uses for grants and aid so the whole process of having a, kind of the, the escrow account and the the audit procedure and the bid requirements um, is very similar almost identical to what the Conservancy followed in uh, in 2006 when we did this the first time Donna? 
And they've, well, they've actually met with Jim Taylor, the building official, and they've met with Jack Flanagan. So they, they do have drawings ready, and it'll be done in phases and bid in phases. And the architectural design came from the, was it the hip, hip tag? The uh, historic grant? The Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation weighed in on the, the design and, and, you know, the, the right way to add right. a, a historically, uh, architecturally sensitive addition to a historic property. So it's, it's kind of gone through a couple right. levels. And that was a 50-50 grant where the state came up with half of the money and the conservancy came up with the rest and the rest was donated to the conservancy. Any further questions, comments? Sensing none, roll call, please. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Edgar. Four. Councillor Falk. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Next item, discussion resolution. <coughs> resolution granting a license to the Hazardville Conservancy Society. Hazardville Institute Conservancy Society. Whereas the Hazardville Institute Conservancy Society has requested grant funding to make improvements to the Hazardville Institute. And whereas the Town of Enfield is desirous to have said improvements made, now therefore be it resolved that the Town of Enfield does hereby provide to the Hazardville Institute Conservancy Society with grant funds in the amount of three hundred thousand dollars in accord. Is this the same, same one? one? Yep. All right. Mine Mine clicked so is it double linked? Too. Nope. It's debatable. Oh, so that, I think I hit it wrong, maybe. But oh, it is. Ah, it is. It's double linked. That's why. Uh, Sorry. Start over. Wasn't just me. I, I'm reading it going. <laughs> I, I just had the read same this one. I, yeah, I read Whereas it twice, the Hazardville Institute Conservancy Society is request has requested the use of town-owned land for the purposes of staging and storing materials and equipment associated with their Hazardville Institute improvement project. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town of Enfield does hereby provide the Hazardville Institute Conservancy Society with a license to use town-owned land in accordance with the terms and conditions attached hereto as reviewed and approved by the town attorney. Be it further resolved that the town manager, Brian R.H. Chadkowski, is authorized to sign the license in the name and on behalf of the town of Enfield. So moved. Second. Discussion. So my only comment is it's very ironic. Um, it's not ironic, but for those of you who knew Ed Allen, um, longtime supporter of Hazardville, and it was always his dream to see the Hazardville Institute uh, renovated and put back to public use. And in his honor and his memory, this gets this building one step closer to, to fulfilling his dream. You drove, I drove by it this weekend and, and looked at it, where most of the time you, you drive by and you just kind of, you notice it. But I took a real hard look at it, and it looks beautiful in the center of Hazardville. And we need to take these last remaining steps to put the building back into productive use for, for the town. We do own it. And um, I want to thank the Conservancy Group. They've worked for years <laughs> plodding along, trying to raise funds. The town has kicked in some. But a lot of it has been privately raised through, that, through the group and the efforts. And uh, let's hope that this brings it um, to fruition in, in a very uh, tight time frame so in correct I have a fine so. collection of Christmas ornaments I do sure do I, I used to go go next. there when I was young when it was a youth center Growlers. talk about dating yes. yourself and I, I love the building I'm glad Fine. to see it it was where I played gym where we had gym classes yeah. in K through 4 when it was raining and we couldn't go outside we walked from Walk the Hazel grammar I feel like red we walked <laughs> from the Hazelville Grammar School to the Hazelville Institute to have our gym classes. Play so, basketball. And play basketball. Yeah, yeah, or dodgeball or whatever upstairs. So, All right. <coughs> Roll call, please. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Edgar. Four. Councillor Fall. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. 
Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. All right, that completes miscellaneous. Next, public communications. Anyone in the audience wishing to address the council? Sensing none. Councillor communications. Councillor Sakala. Really quickly, because I forgot to before, I just wanted to thank um, the buildings and ground crew, Doug Finger, um, Mark Gar, and everybody who, for this past Saturday, softball had their opening day at Eli Whitney, and they did a wonderful job with the fields and got us extra picnic tables and, and trash cans and just did a really great job. And then the week before that, Little League had their opening day, and again, they did a phenomenal job, even with the rain the night before. So a big thank you to them. Awesome job. What What is that little field in the middle? Where? At, at Eli, Eli Whitney. Whitney. The, the instructional field, like a t-ball field. Yeah. That's so cool. So there's a majors, a minors, and an instructional. It's really cute. I saw them out there tonight. It was I'd brand new, I believe, anyone. last year. Oh. Look, that, they look great. Yeah. Another building and grounds. Uh, oh, they yeah. were they Lady installed Bridge. those both on the little league and the softball. And some they got years us ago. our. Um, yeah, very nice. Yes. They got us our nice scoreboard right yeah. before opening day right. too. Cool. Awesome. Pretty cool. The complex the looked great on Saturday. So, packed, which is, which which is great. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. <laughs> a long day. Any other councilor communications? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Councilor Falk. Okay. Seconded by Councilor Bosco. Right. By show of hands. All those in favor? Those opposed? Unanimous. Good night. Yeah.